good. Like, I was obviously really good, but like the level that I wanted to be, I wasn't there yet. Understood. You know what I'm saying? Squeezing that everything out of toothpaste, like. I, I wasn't at that level. So I had to squeeze everything out of toothpaste to be at those levels, to even be in the conversation. Sure. Like, Does he belong here? And um, so I went into college, uh, not even on a full ride, on a three for four. And you're from here? I'm from, uh, I grew up in Chesterfield. Okay. Wildwood, Chesterfield. And then, uh, so I went to college. I got a three for four scholarship where Western Michigan paid for my first year and then I would pay for my second year. But I did so well and, and was a leader and all this stuff. They named me the captain as a sophomore. Um, and, and gave me the, that paid me for that year. So right like I wound on. up getting almost, almost a full ride basically. And, uh, going into college, like nobody would have thought I would turn pro, but I told everybody who's close to me, like, oh yeah, I won't, I won't stay four years. I'll sign in the NHL and I'll leave. And like, I would tell people that and they would, you know, laugh at me or whatever. And I had the opportunities, a lot of opportunities to leave after my sophomore year, decided to stay one more year. And I left after my junior year, I signed with the Boston Bruins and uh, I go to the AHL cause that's like uh, what they do with most guys. So like a farm league. Yeah. Yeah. The farm team. And so th- just to get like your feet wet in pro hockey, kind of like learn at the end of the season, you know, you get 10 games or five games, whatever it is. And, um, I did really well. And they're like, you know, you know, you're going to, you're going to have a shot. Like you're going to probably play and whatever. And I go home that summer and had an accident on the ice, fell into the boards going full speed. Uh, not unconscious. Like don't remember anything for like 12 hours. I lost, I lost memory from the day before. Like, I guess I went to like two hospitals. I had CT scans, x-rays. I remember nothing. I just like came to at 9 p.m. and the skate was at 9 (laughs) a.m. So I don't remember driving there. I don't remember waking up. Don't remember anything. And uh, unfortunately, that was already like I had multiple concussions at that point, like already like a lot. It comes with the contact sports in general. Right. right. And I'm not like somebody who's like, oh, I didn't know. And (laughs) and like, no, no, man. I knew I knew every time when I lied saying that, no, I've only had one and I've already had eight. You know, that's athletes. That was me. Like, I don't fucking care. I would have died to play, you know a hundred games in the NHL. Okay. You could have killed me right after I would have taken that life. And people think I'm crazy for saying that. Maybe they don't believe me, but I'm like, no, no, no. Like seriously, I would have. Those people have never had that thing. Right. Like that's drove them their whole life. Right. You know, my, you know, a lot of parallels, right? Like, so I, you know, went to LSU on a track and field scholarship. Uh, what what was your sport? uh, Shot disc and hammer. Wow. So I was a thrower. Um, and it was like a partial deal, but because of the grades they had, like a kind of equal to full scholarship type of thing. So same type of deal, walked on and then ended up getting a scholarship. Uh, you know, by the time I got toward the end of it, like, yeah, I know I'm not going to the Olympics. Like, <laughs> I don't have it. Right. <laughs> I'm a long fucking way off. Right. Um, and then, you know, left left that and eventually got into strength sports. But man, going into college and seeing those guys that like what the next level took. Yeah. Like you're at like the highest level at that age, but then like right above that, there's another level that is like people, people don't understand like what the high end level of pro sports guys look like. I mean, my brother ended up playing division one football at A&M and was an all American and played a few years in the NFL. Awesome. And you know, he's the largest, most athletic freak dude that most people will ever meet in their fucking life. And he could barely manage to hold on at that level. Wild. Right? Like, Wild. there's such mutants. There, there, There's so many factors that come into play, like biology, you know, the mindset, work ethic. Like, did you get the right coaching? You know, did you have the right strength coach? There's so many different factors and people don't understand that either. It's like, it's crazy. But yeah, so for, so I, I get that concussion and, uh. I, I was just never, I was never the same again, you know, mm. as a, as a player. Cause okay. I missed a whole year. I missed my whole first year of my pro contract right. uh, with the Bruins. Thought I was never going to play again. I got offered, uh, uh, f- I think it was $440,000, uh, tax free from the insurance company. Cause when I came back the next year, the second year of my contract, they're like, okay. Because when I signed, my agent made me get like uh, insurance, you know, pay this much money and you get Thanks, this much bud. covered. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, 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 w- I would have, you know, I had, so then they call me and they're like, all right, you get, if you're going to play this year, you have nine games to decide if you're going to, you know, continue to be a pro hockey player and you'll never be covered for concussions ever again. 
Oh shit. Yeah. So like, and, and it was so bad. Like, dude, I was like, I couldn't be in the grocery store for more than four minutes. Like literally I would be puking or I got lost a couple times and it like uh, almost on my hands and knees. Cause I'd be so dizzy for like six months after it. And, uh, so I'm like, Oh fuck dude, it's a pretty tough decision. Like most people are saying that to me, but I was at, right away. I was like, Nope, don't, I, I'll try. I'll never be able to live myself. They're like, okay, like you'll never be covered for concussions again. So if on the 10th game you get a concussion, you, you're, you're, you're done, your you get no insurance from yeah. us. And for the rest of however long you play, we'll never cover you disability for insurance. And I was like, yeah, I didn't work my whole life to get to this position, right? So I got a shot, That's you know, good. and I, yeah, I got a That's shot. Fucking I, good. Yeah, I, I gave myself a chance because I, I won testing uh, in Boston two years in a row. I was one of the last cuts, the last cut one of the years. And, uh, you know, I just, I kept getting concussions after that in the minors. So I never got called up. Um, and then I finished my career over in Japan and Europe. So I played, okay. I played all, I played Italy, Norway, uh, Hungary, but it was the Austrian league. All, most of the teams were in Austria, um, Japan, Japan, and then back to Hungary in the Austrian league. So, all right. So diving in, man, I've super, so with getting hurt like that, right? Like, so yeah. childhood dream is to play NHL fucking big yeah. league hockey. Yeah. All I ever thought about. And like, you got it. Yeah. And then, my deal. and then, and then like it four, vanishes four months later, I'm fucking a vegetable for a year. Yeah. How's coming through that? It was tough, man. And that's, that's why I asked you about your clothing line. And like, I am, <laughs> I fucking love it because literally when I, when I was into that, my whole thing was like, just if I can get out of this, if I can get out of this, like I will live day by day. I don't even care if I can play hockey again, if I can lift, I couldn't even work out. And like hockey was my life and working at like one a and one a and a half is like training to be a hockey player right. and just working out. I just love working out. I was a very skinny kid, got made fun of when I was younger, you know, whatever. And so like, I, I love training. I love being in the fucking gym. And so I couldn't do either one of those. And I was just like, just give me like, just let me, one day, like just one day, give me one day. And then I'll try and build that to the next day. And slowly over time, I got myself back, you know, it was 15 months between my last game, the concussion, and then my, my first game that like actually counted. So it was, it was 15 like, months. Yeah, man, it was tough. And I had, dude, the worst was I had this nightmare every fucking night for like six to eight months that my teeth were falling out. Really? And it was the most real, like, it was the most real, like I'd wake up all the time with my hands in my mouth. Like, no, that's, dead, and that's such a, like a, a common panic, uh, dream. Like yeah. my, my wife has the same one. Really? Yep. So somebody told me, and you know, probably should have looked into this. I think I did at one point that like somebody had a dream book and they said that, and this is what's hilarious. Yeah. Yeah. Like who fucking can even say right. that for Jesus sure? Christ. Like what? Like what? Let's right. speculate wildly. <laughs> but listen to what they told me. They're like, uh, uh, reading the book. Oh, that means there's something standing between you and your, your goals or your dreams. That's, that's keeping you from them. And I was like, are you fucking just saying that to me? Cause that's the situation I'm in. Well, I mean, but, are you anxious? <laughs> But no, that dream ain't popping up because things right. are great. Yeah. You know what <laughs> every, I mean? Like, no night. shit. Thanks yeah. for filling that one in on the map for me. Right. Every night, too. So I'd just start, like, sleeping on the floor because my bed, I'd wake up drenched in sweat from that nightmare every fucking night. It was terrible. And you just know you're going into it. Like, yeah. Of so course. So that's not down regulating whenever you get ready for bed because heart's fuck. going. I'm going to have that fucking dream. So then I'm trying to, like, not sleep. And then, you know, I learn about <laughs> actual. Trying to not yeah. sleep. Right. How'd yeah. that solution work yeah. out? <laughs> it did, did not fucking work. But, and then, you know, what, what sucks is this was in 2000, I signed in 2008. So this was like 2008 and 2009 Dude, the concussion protocols were a hilarious joke. Yeah. Like, like it was get on the bike, ride, get your heart rate up. If you feel good, go a little harder the next day, the next day, the next day. Okay. Then you'll practice like two, three days later. But if you ride the bike and you feel bad, take two days off and then come back three days later, ride the bike. If you feel bad, take two days off. And it was just like, so it was like, I wasn't doing anything proactive until I, on my own dime, went to go um, see the concussion specialists in Pittsburgh who like are, you know, world renowned Mickey Collins. And I was back like training hard within three months. What did, uh, what did they start having you do different? Um, my, one of my big issues when my vestibular system was really off. So how your ears and eyes talk to each other and. Oh, like, so you get like, um, what's that? Yeah. Uh, vertigo. Vertigo. Like yeah, it yeah. Is, is basically vertigo. But like, if I went like that, like turn my head that fast, I'd be like, Oh fuck for like 30 seconds. If I did like a spinorama, even slow, the world would go sideways. And so I did a lot of rehab for that. 
But when I was coming back and I'd be like riding the bike, cause I was like the test they always made me do guys would be in the gym and I'd be like, just not even talking to them cause I'm doing my test, but I'd be like looking around and they were like, well, because your body's not used to it, your heart rate getting up now for however many months it was at this point, And now you're moving your eyes, which affects your vestibular system. Like, let's try and just keep your head straight. Look at a blank wall. So started with that and it helped immensely. Yeah. And then they were like, you could also try and like lift weights. Cause you can, um, you can, you can, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, I can have control over my heart rate a lot more where if like I'm doing, like I started to, <laughs> my workouts were so funny. I was b- benching the bar <laughs> like, and slowly, like, I'd, I'd just like bench until, until my heart rate got to like 120 and then I'd have to sit there and I'd wait for like minutes for it to go all the way down. And then I'd bench the bar again. However, I didn't even count reps. I wouldn't let myself cause I'd be depressed, <laughs> you know, like this sure, much is sure, getting sure. my heart rate up and I'd be doing like lat pulled out just like 10 pounds, just like slowly controlling my breath, looking forward. But surely enough, like every day I got to do like a couple more reps and a couple more reps. And then I was like, I'll start trying to add five pounds. And then, you know, and then slowly, but surely I got myself back like that way. And I started taking medicine and I'm still on it today, you know, 15 years later or whatever it is. I want to go off it. But the one time I tried to go off it, I got real fucked up. I was like, so back to vertigo. uh, It it wasn't that it was more like withdrawal. What uh, what is it? uh, uh, It's uh, a Zoloft 50 milligrams. Okay. So it's like a SSRI. Yeah. So they said that what they, cause I didn't really have depression other than like, Cause you know, I had to see psychologists and talk to the doctors every fucking yeah, fuck, week. Of course, I went to dude. doctors like four to five times a week, but they were like, Oh, one of the positive benefits of SSRIs is they help with your vestibular system. I don't know if they're just fucking saying that to me or not. But, uh, when I started taking them in the beginning, the, the dosage was too low, didn't feel anything at all. And then I got up to 50 and I started feeling a lot better. So I've been taking that for like 15 years. Whoa. And the one time that I got off it, it was the first year I was back healthy and so I'm seeing the fucking like best neurologist at Mass General Hospital in Boston because, you know, I'm with the Bruins. Sure. So I'm fuck like yeah. The right. Best fucking doctors in, in Boston. And they didn't tell me to like wean myself off them. And I don't know anything about SSRIs or whatever. And so like, she's like, yeah, you know, you're feeling good. You're playing well, whatever. Like, yeah, let's try stopping the medicine. And I'm like, okay. So I just stopped taking it cold. Oh, turkey. just cold turkey. Okay. Dude, like three days later, I couldn't get out of bed. Like I literally, I don't. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm not like a drug addict or anything, so I've never had withdrawals, but I, I would assume that's what withdrawals are like. Like I was dry sweat, but you know, like dry sweats and like curled in a ball and like, I felt fucking terrible. So that scared the shit out of me to ever stop them again, because I called them after like five days when I realized, oh, there's a connection. I'm so <laughs> stupid, like a dumbass. Cause I'm just listening. Like, oh yeah, you'll be fine. There'll be no problem. Sure. Stop taking them. And I started taking the medicine again. And like two days later, I'm totally fine. And I was like, oh man, so I'm, I'm scared to, t- to not take them honestly. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm sure at some point you would, you've got to wean all yeah, I know. Or do like, something. I, everybody's like, okay, well you should take seven eighths of a pill for like two weeks and then, and then six eighths, then five eighths and just do that for like as long, like a really long drawn out process. So like I, I plan to do that, but right as soon as I retired, I stepped into my, my business that I had been building while I was playing in the off seasons. And like, now I'm like, well, I can't be fucked up and then go to work and train guys. Like what? That's so, so, you know. Yeah. It's a complicated cycle, right? Yeah. That like, I don't have the downtime to get through this to, yeah. to correct, which look, I think at some point's a bit of a lie that you. Yes. 100%. Yeah. Don't want Call to deal me out. with. Yeah. Call me out. Yep. Um, Stu, when I, so I, my, my, my career in the Highland games ended up ending just due to an injury as well. And one of the things you talked about there that I want to see what you think about was Man, that feeling of being like you're a professional fucking athlete, right? Like this machine that you operate in has fucking responded and done anything you've ever asked of it. Right. Since you were a kid. Right. I know what it's like being a good enough athlete that college wants. Like, yo, you can fucking do whatever right. you want. Right. Jump fences and yeah. fuck off and whatever else. The feeling of going from that to it not working. Yeah. Because this isn't fucked up. Right. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Right. They're like, why won't it do the things? It's always done. How, how is that? Uh, well, it was awful obviously, but the hardest part is like when it, 
your brain isn't your knee. So like if I'm, you know, I had to go to the rink every day and then I would drive to Boston like half an hour, 40 minutes down the road and see doctors four to six days a week, every fucking week. Bruin said I could live in Boston, but I was like, no, no, I want to go to Providence. So soon I'll wake up one day, I'll be fine and I'll be playing. That didn't happen that whole season. Um, but, uh, the hard part was going to the rink every morning and walking in and like trying to be in a good mood, trying to like fake it till I make it be in a sure. good mood. I'm going to wait. It's today's going to be a day. I'm going to feel good today, you know? And then everybody like seeing me physically walking, I'm not in a cast. I don't have a splint on, like I don't, I'm not in a sling, mm-hmm. you know? And so like, they're like, you look great. Like you going to skate today. I'm like, bro, I'm lucky if I don't pass out trying to take shit, you know, like I, I'm going up the stairs is hard for me now because I'm so out of shape. And I was also like, and this is where the lack of, 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 um, knowledge like really sucks looking back is like, and then also I'm thinking, okay, well I can't let my body fat get above 10%. So I'm under eating, which is also terrible for your fucking brain, terrible for my fucking brain. Not, not. You know, I, I was yeah, nobody. Still, nobody recommends a ketogenic diet at this point. Nobody, nobody recommend recommends anything. carnivore or something like that. That's a high fat diet. That's anti-inflammatory. That right? can help. Right. Right. Exactly. Nobody. Nobody even talked about my diet. Nobody talked about my diet. Nobody talked about my sleep. You know, they 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 sent me to a psychologist one time just to like just he just asked like are you depressed or anything and I was like well like I'm I'm not like a little I'm not like <laughs> depressed like out of nowhere like all my dreams came true and then the carpet was ripped right. out from under me so like I'm fucking angry I'm I'm like you know all these things but like obviously like that would anybody would be so I wasn't like no I don't need to talk to you when I look back I'm like fuck I'm sure I could it would have obviously <laughs> yeah, no would have helped right? like fucking dummy like if I needed it and that everybody you know my parents want to call me and talk to me and I don't want to fucking talk about it so nope. then that makes me more angry when people ask me about it I'm like I don't fucking know when I'm gonna be okay I don't know and I have no control over this whereas every other part of your career as an athlete you control your destiny for the most part, like 99% of it, how you show up. Do you go early? Do you stay late? Do you, do you try and win at everything you fucking do? And like, that was me. And that was the only reason I was there. And all of that was taken away. And so, you know, that's why I fucking love your clothing brand to circle all the way back because, uh, that message is like, I, I live day to day. Like I'm going to, I'm going to fuck my day up. Like that's my goal. And then I go to sleep and I do the same thing tomorrow, but it's one day at a time. And that's, getting me to where I want to go, you know, man, it, um, you know, after my injury, right. Be, like being able what, to, what'd you injure? So I had a knee go south on me. Mm. Um, so I wrapped up my 2016 season throwing many had been bummed on the way there. I'd torn an ACL in college, got it fixed and then tore it again at a skate park. Uh, yeah. and didn't have any insurance cause I was fucking 22. Yeah. Um, and so Competed the whole time that I did in the Highland Games on it without the ACL and strongman, powerlifting, some weightlifting and other shit. And uh, it's, it wore out. Apparently, I built some bone spurs that took care of, like, range of motion issues. But so, like, eventually, um, I couldn't extend the leg all the way, which keeps you from extending the hip, which means I can't push. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, like, throws are just getting shittier. And they don't feel good. Right. There's a difference if they still feel like I'm doing it well. Right. But missing throws feels like fucking trying to fight in a dream. It's the goddamn worst feeling ever. And so I was like, fuck it, we'll go in for an ACL surgery. I ended up having nine. Oh. Um, so I had like five ACL surgeries. Yeah. They, so my body just kind of doesn't Rejected deal it. with cadaver tissue. Wow. And I'd already used uh, the patella tendon and hamstring tendon on the first round in college. Oh my God. So nine, nine knee surgeries, which we finally ended and got me out of like really bad chronic pain. Like I was traveling with a cane and like, couldn't go up and down stairs and uh Jeez. total knee replacement at 36. Uh, oh my God, man. And so, yeah, it's a similar thing, man. Like I was, I felt trapped in this machine that like, I no longer had the fucking controls over. Right. And, you know, I can now recognize the depression that I was in, but I couldn't at the time because I just didn't have a vocabulary for really understanding what that's like. Right. Right. Um, the chronic pain part of it was, you know, its own thing. And, you know, I look at my injury and what that brought out in me because, you know, I walk with a fucking limp and all this, but yours is invisible. Yeah. Yeah. And that's tough. And I think the same way with depression and chronic pain can be the same way, right? That like you still look like you're in shape and all this, but people don't understand. Right. Right. And so, you know, trying to explain to people that you love that like, nah, man, I'm not going out. 
because yeah. it's going to be bright in there. Dude. Yeah. That, that, and that's a tough one too. Like I really have to protect my energy. I, I expend a lot of energy in all the things I do. You know, I, when, when it's off season time, you know, I train up to 130 guys a day and it's only me. Wow. Yeah. It's a lot. And like, where are you training at? Uh, my gym is in a rink in Chesterfield. Okay. So like the guys can work out with me and then skate right out. Oh, right yeah. on. So like I wanted to have that, that set up. So, um, it's awesome, but like I put out a lot of energy. So like I get home and <laughs> sometimes I feel so bad for my fiance, Kylie, cause I'm like, I'm like. I'm like whispering to her and I'm like, babe, like I, I can't talk for like the next hour. My head hurts. I've been screaming for 12 straight hours. All I've been jumping around, demonstrating, pumping guys up, like keeping the energy going. And, and, and then with my like brain stuff too, if I don't sleep, like I don't feel a lot of effects from my concussions anymore at this time, other than if I don't sleep well for like well, three you've, nights. You've now built the habits that, right that right. help manage it. Yeah. And like, I, and, and I don't overextend myself. Like I used to be like a people pleaser when I was younger and be like, Oh, I'll, especially when I was starting building my business and stuff, like I would have to go do things where I knew it would be at a detriment to how I would feel and maybe perform the next day. But I looked at it as something I had to just fucking sack up and do. So I did it. And now like when, especially when I work a lot, I'm just, I'm, it's very easy for me to say no to things. And I'm like, I'm sorry. Like I, I got to take a nap. Yeah. I'm fucked up. Like I'll be fucked up. If I don't, if I don't take care of myself, if I don't eat well. If I don't sleep every night, like I, I will not be able to perform my job. And since, you know, whoever's inviting me over to their house, like you're not paying my bills. Like I got to do what pays my bills, you know, like, well, like that you, mindset, you know, why do you think people have such struggle with like setting that boundary as, as a person? Uh, I mean, obviously they don't understand it cause they've never been through like, you know, this type of, these types of injuries. Yeah. But I think anybody, I think people get overextended, right? Yeah. Like oh, your yeah. average people will just get overextended with obligations and this thing and moving in to the point where you're not even present where I'm just trying to get through the next thing because they got another thing on the list to do mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they don't do anything to change about it. They just feel like and they're see. not at the wheel making that decision. Right. I think too many people just care about what other people think about them. And it's the people that don't matter that, cause like any of my friends, if like really good friends or, or, you know, mostly my family, if I'm like, listen, like I can't come to that. I can't like, I worked 90 hours this week right. or whatever. Like, my best friends would be like, yeah, I've been in the gym with you. I know. Got like, it. Go home and go to sleep. But like, it's everybody else outside that. But I've just gotten to a point now, especially over the last couple of years where I'm like, you know, I have to do what I have to do. It's interesting who it sorts out of your life. It's really interesting. It's really right, that interesting. It's like, oh, wow. Like if this thing operates in any other way than your expectations of me then we don't have much of a relationship. It's right. Like, okay. Noted. And you're, so you're an entrepreneur, obviously like, and, and for me, it's usually people who are entrepreneurs that get it. <laughs> yeah. Especially people who've like had to really like grind like well, and build their whatever. More than entrepreneurs. Like I find it, it's people that have decided to be fully fucking accountable at their life. Yeah. Right. That like, I'm aware that my success or failure, my happiness, my whatever is on me. Right. I've got to decide where I spend my energy and who my time gets invested in. Right. And not just to grow financial worth, but to grow my own self. Like yeah. I want to connect with other people that get it. Right. 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 Like spending right. I mean, time that's what you said that. when you reached out to me, you're like, I just want to hang out with good motherfuckers. I think that's what you said. It. You said killers. I just want to hang out with other fucking killers. And I was like, oh, I fucking like this guy. That's it, man. Like people that have that energy and that drive and that thing, yo, it's really alienating dealing with a civilian population. Yeah. Because- yeah. You know, trying to explain, right? Like when people ask me about throwing and they, they talk about like, you know, what kept you motivated and this and that. I'm like, what the fuck were you talking about? <laughs> That's all I wanted to do. Yeah. yeah. I was obsessed with it. That's like I lost friendships because I'm going to do this. I'm right. not justifying it or fucking explaining it to you. I have to go do this thing. Yeah. I know it doesn't make sense. <laughs> Take doesn't me matter. Me. Right? Take me or leave me. You know, and that's really not something most people, especially most men have after high school sports. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I always, whenever, like my family always wanted to go on vacation. And like I told you earlier, like I wasn't at those higher levels. I wasn't good enough to like just coast on talent like that. I didn't have it, you know, at that level, I had talent, but not that level of talent. Right. So like I, I could, I could count on one hand how many training sessions I missed from when I started training at 15 till I retired at 32. I missed less than five. Like, and I worked out six days a week, every fucking week, every off season and in season, I worked out four days a week 
every fucking day, you know, I did not miss and going on family vacations. And I'd be like, all right, I gotta go to the gym. I'll see you guys in like three hours. Like we're on vacation. And I'm like, and, and, but here's something that, that, was really vacation. Uh, yeah yeah i don't vacations like i just want to do the things i like in another place right. and i like training <laughs> yeah I like, like, this is vacation you know, this isn't me. a break for me i'm not punished fucking taking care of myself every day <laughs> right. i like this right. what right. i don't want to do is sit on the beach and get fucking loaded for six hours right. and complain about shit right yeah exactly but what's, what's what was kind of a breakthrough for me it was the first year that i i retired from hockey we went on like a family vacation um to las vegas with with my parents and my sister and her family and and i was like okay i gotta go to the gym and they were like be retired now I'm like you go to the gym but i stopped them and i was like and i sat them down and i was like guys like this is something i have to do right, not only that. because like this is who i am and this is how i operate to be successful and to be where I want to go and stuff. But also like I've had 14 concussions. Physical fitness is massively important for me today, but really important for me 30 years from now or 20 years from now. Like I have to stay fit. I have to like, I have to. And so this is part of it. Like I'll try and get up a little earlier and go, but like, this is something I have to do. So I'll meet you wherever, whatever you guys want to do. Don't wait for me. And they were just like, Oh, well that makes sense. And, you know, they just don't get it, but, but they got it then. Like, right. But when I stopped and I, and I said like, guys, I, and also like, also like emotionally, I need that outlet. I need to like go and spend it. Like I need to be intense. Like that's me. That helps me be calm the rest of the day. I need this. And they, they totally got it. And from then on, it's been five years. If we ever go on vacations or they have something and I'm like, I have to go to the gym. They're like, okay, come right after. Yep. And they get it. So I was like, damn, dude, obviously I wasn't good at communicating this my whole life before this. Yeah. I think it becomes tough. Right. And a lot of people, especially at a younger age, right? Like you can always take it as such this slight mm -hmm. of like, you're, you're showing off. Yeah. Like, who are yeah. you working out for? Like, you know, I'm working out for me. You don't get it. Yeah. But most people don't have that inner fire, right? right. Like most people have just done the expectations that have been set for them by their parents or the environment or the yep. community they were brought up in. Right. And never actually get to decide, like, I love this. I'm going toward that thing. I know it doesn't make sense to you. That's cool with me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I'm going 100. Like <laughs> Right. And and for lunatics like us, because, you know, we are. Yeah, yeah. And, like, any time I've avoided consistently training, you know, I get fucking weird. Weird. I get super fucking weird and I get too fucking anxious and I don't, I, I have to burn off some extra amount of bullshit from yeah. my system so that I'm more calm and I can handle things a bit better. Otherwise, yeah, I just get weirdly self-destructive. Yeah. I just, I just like, and also when I let my workout slip, um, especially like, like not doing them at the the level that I want to do them at, you know, whether it's a I'm tired or whatever it is. Like if I can't hit that intensity level that I want to be at, like other things in my life don't go as well because I'm, I know it's funny. We talked about this on our podcast that came out today um, with my buddy Mark about how he just got back on it. He just opened his own business downtown St. Louis. It's called Omen coffee. And uh, he's never owned any kind of brick and mortar. Hell yeah. He's, rock and he's, roll. He's never sold coffee. He's never been a coffee guy like that was like into it that much, but he just always wanted to have a coffee shop. So he left first for him, started a fucking coffee shop, learning on the fly as he's doing all this it's stuff. the only way it works, yeah. dude. Everything's on the job training. Right, You're fucking Everything. pretending that you're going to have it figured out when you show up. Yeah. There's yeah. some, I some love that. bullshit explanation that people want, right? Of like, and I don't know whether it comes from childhood or whatever it is that like, I'm expected to know how to do this the first time I do it. Right. Not the case. Never, right? Like, no. I, I can remember times in my life where I've said things like, oh, I'm a shitty carpenter. You know, I've probably cut two dozen pieces of wood in my life. Like, no shit, you're <laughs> yeah. a bad carpenter. <laughs> Duh. Yeah. Right. Like, yeah, you learn. Fuck, that's as, how it rolls. You, you suck at it. You learn. I always say you learn, adapt, apply. Get better. Next time. You'll get a little bit better, but you still probably suck. Learn, adapt, apply. You get a little, and it's just building brick by brick by brick, but till one day you look back and you're like, holy fuck, I'm good now. So how do you, how do you manage the insecurity that comes with sucking at a new thing? Oh, uh, dude, I, I don't even care anymore. You don't even care. Right, right. Because I learned, because yeah, I learned, yeah, same. I learned like through, and through my hockey career, first and foremost, mainly because like, 
I, I sucked at a lot of things and I had to just keep doing them over and over until I got it. And then it was in my bag. It was in my skill set. And then, you know, I'd learn the next thing and I'd suck. And I just, I lost the humility. Like, it was just like, I, I can't think I'm sweet. Like I'm not good enough. Right. And I won't make it to that next level. Like, okay, I'm good now. My goal isn't to be in this level. I'm trying to get to fucking this level. So I've got to do things that are better than this level and keep doing that. And you obviously suck at those at first. And then my, my entrepreneurship journey, I started my, my training company after my third season pro. And I would just come home in the off season and, and run that. So it'd be like, I'd work out like three hours in the morning and then start training guys. And it's, it's wild though. The first summer I had two clients and I charged $25 for a two hour session. And I had to pay the gym that I grew up training in 33%. So I was making, um, I was making $9 an hour. Lifestyles if you break that of the down. rich and famous right? athletes. And man, I, was I, a current, I was a current pro athlete. I was like, nobody will come to me, you know, whatever. I'll just make it $25 for two fucking hours. So twelve fifty an hour. So I was actually making $9 an hour doing that. I had two clients the first year. And the truth is you are a beginner coach. I was, and I sucked. I yeah, sucked. Of course. And I thought I was sweet because I knew what I knew, but I sucked at coaching it. No, we've seen it too many times we, as an athlete. It's like, oh, I could do that. Yeah. I and then you're that. like, fuck, yeah, they're co- good at that. <laughs> coaching is a fucking skill and it's an art. It is a, it is an art form. And I thought, oh, because I can do all these great things in the gym and I win and every testing everywhere I go, like I'll just be a sick coach, but I was terrible at getting the client to understand or do what I wanted them to do. Um, so I, I sucked, you know, but every year I did better and better and better. So I went from like two clients. I don't remember what I had the second year, eight, 13, 33, a hundred, 300 in the summer I'd work with through camps and organizations and stuff until I retired, um, throughout the summer. So like, I, I just kept seeing like fail, you know, Oh, I can do that better. I can do that better. I can do that better. And then also I listened, I would listen to my podcast. I started a podcast at the time, the hockey one I told you about, um, the hockey think tank podcast. And I sucked at that. I didn't, the only podcast <laughs> yep. I ever listened to was Joe Rogan and I loved like, it. That's I, easy. Yeah. Fuck. Uh, yeah. He, Oh, it's so easy. Just sits there and talks. Right. And so my cousin asked me, who's, who's like a real brainiac, great guy, unreal hockey player. He's like, let's do a podcast. And I was just like, yep. Cause I learned by that time to just say yes to everything. Mm-hmm. Just, I watched the movie. Yes, man. With Jim Carrey changed my life. I started saying yes to everything just to like get new experiences and then see if I liked it, see if I could pull that somehow into what, whatever I was doing. So I was like, yep. And we were awful, but we started listening back and being like, where could we be better? Where could we be better? And I, and I would just every day learn something new about how to be better for the listener just from like the experience, you know, like, oh, if you're talking, I shut up. I can't talk over you because then all they hear is, you know, like little details. So I just like, I did all these things that were out of my comfort zone. It wasn't like a skill set I had. And then I would just be like, oh yeah, I suck. But like by episode two, I'm better than one. And by 10, I'm better than nine. So I just keep doing things. And I've just like kind of, and now use that in my whole life. Any, any aspect, That's I don't it. care. I'll say yes. And I'll tell you, hey, I might not be good at the first time, but Next week I'll be back and I'll be a lot better. Yeah, repetition. Yeah, repetition every, does everything. everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's the biggest unlock that I took away from my athletic career. Mm-hmm. You know, being able to. The real transition was my brain being able to understand how do I apply it, the same way to my business. And where'd you make that? How'd you make that connection? Was there like, was there like an epiphany or was there like something where you were like, Oh, that's just like what I did throwing or. Right. It was, it was that, that ability to look at it without emotion. That, yeah. Right. To be able to look at what happened last time without emotion and just try to look at some data and decide, do I want to go that way or not? If you yeah. don't want to go that way, that's fine. But right. understand that you're taking the responsibility to trust your gut instead of whatever it means. Right. 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 But it's on me. Yeah. You know, and so learning that and then just like what it's show up every day. Like there isn't any other way around this other than me being intentional with my time and show up every fucking day consistently trying to move the needle a little. Cause when you were, when you were in your career, I'm sure you had bad days and bad, pra- bad, bad days as far as you felt like shit going to train yeah. or you showed up to a competition and you felt like shit, but what did you do? You still had to fucking do the thing. You still had to find a way. And when you, when you're in those days, I think sometimes it really helps to like take emotion out when you're a pro athlete and you're like, I have a job to do. This is what I get paid for. Like mm-hmm. I have to do this. And that's a, sometimes you get emotion involved, but like when, when you're three and three for hockey, you're, <laughs> you know, you've been in three cities and three nights, you're fucking gassed. Everybody's tired, you know? And it's like, Oh, do I, re- 
I never felt like this a lot. There were times, you know, but like a lot of guys would be like complaining, like, oh, fuck, three and three again. Yeah, Here we go. Fucking low you know? vibration right, shit, dude. Right? Like, yeah. And I'm like, shut the fuck up. Don't even, don't even affect my positive headspace. Yeah. But I would just be like, take the emotion, those, those rare days where you don't want to be there, take the emotion out, do what you do, fucking hit all the fun things, just checklist, bang, bang, bang. This is what I always do. So I'm going to keep doing it. Tomorrow I'll come back. My head will be clear, you know, and, and I'm good. What, what I'm amazed at is like after this many years and training consistently this long and all those things, right. That like whatever that inner bitch voice is that we've all got, mm -hmm. I, I just figured it would stop showing up at some point. Like it would just quit trying to show up every fucking day yeah. before I'm on the treadmill or before I'm doing my thing or when nope. I get up out of bed or before I get in the cold plunge. Like I just thought, you know, after 20 years, right? Like that voice doesn't show up anymore. Yeah. Nope. No, it's Still there. fucking there every day. You just walk past it and ignore it. Is it there way more now? I'm assuming yes, but correct me if I'm wrong, that you're not training like for something that is like your passion. Cause that's something that people so, always told me like, Oh, just wait till you don't have something to train for. Yeah. I struggle. Now I get it. Yeah. I, I really, really struggle with it. I get it. Uh, like I need something, something, you need um, something. I, I'll still train. Yeah. But I won't be nearly as accountable. Right. I'll fuck off a lot more and right. I'll do, I'll do the minimum. Right. Um, but the minimum for you is at a much higher bar. Than yeah, no. Else. I mean, look, it isn't what it was, right? Because right. I can't really chase strength. I, do, I can't lift how I want to lift. Yeah. Because how my, hard is that, It's man? the worst, dude. Like, I want to lift violent and fucking heavy because I like focusing on big lifts and doing all that. And so I don't ever get that moment. Yeah. And so that main big stress of, like, teaching yourself how to perform when it counts that comes with big lifts or as an athlete it's rare for me to get to scratch that itch anymore. Yeah. But I've also done it hundreds and hundreds of fucking times, right? Yeah. Like I got that ability. Yeah. I can make it fucking go when it's go time. Right. The hard part now is I've switched kind of more to endurance training because it's like, oh, fuck, I suck at this. Yeah. I got a bum knee. I'm fucking 40. I'm never going to be a good runner. Yeah. And so like that takes away any expectations of like the lunatic part of me clicking into being like, we're going to be a fucking yeah. runner. Go, go, it's catch like, that motherfucker. Stop, asshole. <laughs> <laughs> we're never going to be good enough at this. Like it only has to matter to you. And so that kind of keeps that part of me chained up a bit. Yeah. And um, now it's, it's far more like I, I'll set a goal and decide like, what can I learn doing it between now and then. So like the first endurance thing I did was like an ultra marathon in Bryce Canyon and did, um, what was it? Like almost 20 miles. Oof. And, uh, that was like the first thing I trained for post fake knee. Yeah. And so I was like, well, fuck, can I run? Yeah. And so I kind of, I can. Yeah. I couldn't at the time, but I mean, got to where I could do five miles without stopping and manage pain through rehab and recovery, things I needed to do, but uh -huh. I have to be on point of everything to yeah. make it work. Yeah. And so, but it definitely unlocks something again in me of like, I'm not as fucked up and fragile as I thought I was. Mm, yeah. That's and that was nice. a big shift for me mentally. And so the hard thing that's come with the endurance stuff is because I like, I love fast, violent, explosive stuff. I'm a yeah. thrower, man. Like nothing yeah. takes more than fucking two seconds. <laughs> that's what she said. And so, yeah, right. <laughs> Fuck a powerful hip drive. Two seconds. Give it all you got. Uh, but doing the endurance stuff where it's like, oh, I've got four hours today. Oh. And so like it becomes this way different fight mentally for me with ADHD and yeah. fucking being a lunatic of like I can catch myself lying to try to get out of it. Right. And I'm like, well, oh, we don't have time or like, you know, I'm like, you, you do. Yeah. You yeah. have time. But asshole. how good does it feel when you do it? That's on right. The days when you don't you know, it's want telling to. that voice to go fuck itself. Yeah. And it's yeah. like you don't get a vote. Right. Right. And, and so the endurance part that I've really liked though is, yeah, I've never had a gas tank, right? Like as an athlete. Right. And, but now it. I do. Yeah. And so we did, I did a, you familiar with the Katy trail? Yeah. Um, last October I set out, trained and rode it and did it in a day. Wow. So like 243 miles, Woo. it was 21 hours, 22 minutes of a solid attempt. Ooh. Started at midnight. Bike? Uh, yeah. Just a gravel bike. Yeah. Um, I think the one that's out there, uh, but man, the, the real like challenge of that for me was which will quit first, my body or my brain. Yeah. Like one of them's going to fucking try to give up. Who, who, who lost? I finished. Uh -huh. I finished and I'm it either. was all right. Yeah. And like, cause I'd figured out how to fuel and hydrate myself over the 16 weeks leading up to it. So I didn't cramp. I realized I have to fucking shovel food in the whole time. How do you do that? Are you eating like goo or what just are you gummy doing? bears? Gummy bears. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> gummy bears. Yeah. You, they'll just put, they'll dissolve eventually. <laughs> um, 
But it was neat seeing like when I got really depleted that I could throw like a Snickers in and I'm like, oh, that's 300 calories. And it would burn in about the appropriate amount of time to like watch what I was doing calorically every hour. It was like, oh shit. Wow. I just felt all of that energy enter the system and leave. Wow. That's cool. And so that was cool. Like as an athlete, I've never been that like dialed dial in or, or smoked. That. Yeah. You know, that the, the fire was burning that low. Wow. That's cool. And so that was kind of cool. Yeah. Um, that was cool. The other thing that's come with it is there's a, there's a certain mental thing that comes from the endurance part that I've never had as an athlete of just being able to like, Oh, I can fucking grind. Yeah. And that has applied to work and anything else is like, yo, I can show up and I can give attention and focus on this. And so it's been really good. That's pretty me. cool. Plus it man. helps my knee and hip, you know, moving more is better. Yeah. I was going to ask you how it's affecting your hip. Like it's not great. I'm sure your stride is different than it would have been. Right. So Um, like, like really taking care of your ankle and your hip above and below the knee. Ankle's good. The hip, the hip needs to probably be replaced. Yeah. Yeah. It's already, it's not great. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) The hip's way worse than the knee at this point. The the replaced knee is pretty fucking fine. how's How's your low back? Shot. Yeah. yeah. But was it already from um, your, what you did or do you think No, like definitely doing? from the surgeries. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, just from the change of my gait and then I limped for a few years and so the hip got shot because it took the brunt instead right. of me walking on the knee. Right. All those things. Yeah, man, um, that's where it's... Uh, everything's connected. Everything's connected, Most right? people don't think about that stuff. Like, and it's like, dude, everything's connected. How you start, how your foot strikes the ground matters. Mm-hmm. You know, like people always are chirping me on, on Instagram, like talking, like I'm always talking about feet. And I'm like, yeah, the first thing that hits the ground, if your foot's like twisted, then your ankle's twisted, your knee's twisted, your hip's twisted, your spine's twisted, your neck's twisted. And it's all because of what's happening at your foot. So you got to train your fucking feet. People are like, what's with you in feet? I'm like, it's not a foot thing. It's a performance thing. Thing, you know, <laughs> yeah. Um, any long term stuff from like the brain impact, or, or sorry, you know, we, we covered a bunch of that. What I really want to dive into is so I like having this big dream, right? And then, then, like, going to play in Europe and going to play in Japan and doing all this type of stuff. Like, in the moment, does that feel like insecure and embarrassing that you're not playing at the high level uh, that you yeah. dreamed about? No, there's, there's definitely, there's definitely. A part of that there's no doubt about it because you know you come home and you play you like come home in the summer and like oh you know where are you playing now and be like oh i'm playing in japan and they're like oh do you like get paid for that I'm like yeah i'm making six figures and right they right. pay my taxes and give yeah, me yeah but it doesn't it ain't the but same it's not the nhl you know and it's not the ahl you know so so like people people never never you know i remember my mom telling me like multiple times that her friends were like when's jeff gonna give up playing hockey and, and like, I'd be like, well, you know, I'm making pretty, still pretty damn good money. Yeah. And then I also started my own business that started bringing in money. And by the end of it, my, my business was bringing in in three months, what I was also making in my, my hockey career for the, for the eight months. And, and so I was like, I'm doing pretty well right now. I don't know, but like nobody, nobody gets that. You're not in the NHL. So like, there is a little bit of that, but then, but then also like my whole life, I was able to, to shut out anybody who said anything about me. I don't care. Or I just like use it as fuel. It's like, okay, talk that shit. Tell me I won't make it or tell me I'm a nerd or tell me that. Okay. All right. All right. I go to the gym and I think about that and it makes me fucking jump higher, run faster, throw harder, whatever, lift more. And so like, I've always been able to like use that type of shit as fuel and really let anything get to me. Where do you think, think using that as fuel instead of getting overwhelmed by it stems from like, I mean, what were relationship with your parents like or uh, athletics or yeah, no, uh, my dad was a ref and he did it professionally. Uh, he ref world juniors, which is like the biggest tournament you can ref for 20 year olds in the world. It's like really, really big in the U S it's not big, but everywhere else it's huge. Um, and he ref like pro in college and stuff. So like he, he, he was with that. My mom wasn't an athlete, but they were, they were just amazing. Like they, they were, I was, I'm so, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't have done anything I did in hockey if I didn't have them. Like we never talked about sports other than my dad's only advice to me always was hard work, patience, more hard work. My dad's an entrepreneur. I saw that dude grind every fucking day. My mom is the best mom ever and took care of us, you know, to my sister and I, you know, anything we needed, wherever we needed to be driven, you know, you know, like punished me when I was a little shithead. Like I had unbelievable parents. So my dad, my dad just like was like that, that those things. Hard work, patience, more hard work. He's like, don't worry, Jeff. Just hard work, patience, more hard work. That's all you got to do. Like, just fucking do that. And and I'd always say that to myself. And so 
uh, I also realized at a young age that I didn't have the skill that my best friends did who were better than me. And so in seventh grade, when I was like the worst player on the team, I went to the rink every day by myself every day every day yep. for hours i was the only person on this the ice familiar. by myself and eighth grade year i went from the 12th forward to like the sixth and how I, I was everybody's like what did you do like, worked my ass off yeah by, my, by myself every fucking day so then the next summer eighth grade going to ninth grade i took it up a notch and then I was the best player on the team. Let's and then I was, go. and th then it was over. Then it was like, th well, this is my path. And back then. Well, you, you figured out a recipe. I figured, I figured out the cheat code. Yep. Work harder than everybody else. That's it's really not figured it out. It was like work harder than everybody else. And then when I got to college, I learned let's add work smarter than everybody else. So now I'm working harder and smarter. And that's how I was able to achieve what I did from college on you know for me being a guy who wasn't that good mm -hmm. you know naturally compared to the guys at those higher levels yeah i mean man seeing again like that talent level right like you know watching my brother being all american in high school like i know what good football players look like i right. didn't have it I'm right six foot dude playing offensive line ain't nobody trying to wow pay me to you know go play in right big sports um so you were the same. You had to be, you had to be doing, you stay, stayed late, showed up early. Well, especially when it got to track and field, like with football, I didn't because it's, it's What's such a team sport that like uh, I could go run or train longer. Right. But right. like you can't practice football longer. Right. At least I didn't know how. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but with track and field, like I can definitely remember like going to track meets my like sophomore and junior year of high school where I'd win. And I wasn't happy with how I felt compared to practice that week. Mm. And I went back to track and through. Fuck for a couple yeah. hours, like Love a fucking it. lunatic with headlights on. Love it. Um, Love and, it. and like, no shit. Of course, we both have similar stories to yeah. that, right? Dude, I remember, so. I remember going to a 24-hour fitness on a Friday night after I had a bad workout. And then I went to a party, like a high school party. And I, I, I never drank in high school, like maybe a couple times a year, right? Two I drank a, a lot in high school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was, yeah, I'm I was from never, Louisiana. It's yeah. part, of the, part of the rules. <laughs> Every, everybody else did, but I was just like, I'm going to play in the NHL. And mm -hmm. they all laugh at me and I, I don't fucking care. But I remember working out going to a high school party. I was probably a senior, maybe a year out. And, uh, I went back to, I went to home, went to bed, left the party early and went to bed, was in bed, pissed off about my workout, got back up two 30 AM, went to the gym, worked out two 30 to four 30 or whatever. And then went back to sleep. And, uh, and, and, but like, I don't think people need to do that. I I'd say they probably shouldn't do that often. Right. It happens every now and then and you do that. It's like you with running. You're on that or you're on that, you know, nineteenth mile or whatever the fuck it is, and you're you're like, Yeah, I've done enough. I've done enough. Fuck you, you haven't done enough. Go do a little bit more. And like just that one time, the confidence that you earn from those types of things that you did something that you know everybody else is sleeping right now and I'm getting fucking better. That's the thing that like I got off on and that allowed me to to be a little bit better on the ice, which allowed me to do whatever I was able to do. Yeah. I remember, I remember thinking the same thing, like Highland games being kind of a weird sport, right? So like, there's probably like 20 of us good in the world. Wow. And we see 15 of us every weekend. Yeah. And so we compete like 23, 24 times a year, I think is what Holy my schedule shit. was. Like I didn't I know pretty, that pretty every weekend for the most part, um, for about six months. Yeah. And, uh, so all of us train by ourselves in a garage somewhere and, and in a field by ourselves. <laughs> and so like, these are the only other assholes that we'd ever run into right. each other that like get how stupid get. this thing is that we're fucking pursuing. Um, but yeah, man, no doubt about those days. Cause I remember those days and feeling like, you know, I'm not in control of the genetics I've got. Like, I know I'm missing some pieces, right? Like for strong man and for, Highland games, like the best guys in the world and especially in the pro class, like the average height and weight, it's like six foot three, three twelve. Yeah. And I'm six foot at best. And you know, my best mobility and space speed and everything's about two eighty. And so I'm already given up a ton. Right. And so like, I knew that like, I couldn't genetically win. Right. So the only thing I can do is make goddamn well sure that on days that it counts, I show up and bring my best. Right. And getting out work to choice. Yeah. Fuck getting out work. Yeah. I'll, if I can show up and throw my best and keep making improvements and take PRs and take fourth is way better than fucking winning and it feeling shit. Yeah. That I didn't give a good effort. Right. I don't want to win because my competition was worse. Yeah. I, I want to fucking beat the best. Yeah. I, that's it. Like the whole time I did it, I just wanted to be on the field with the best in the world and see where I fucking stack up. Right. I think, I think that's maybe, uh, 
one of the reasons I had that same mindset that didn't matter what league I was in. Like I went over to Europe the first year and I played in Italy, which that year, luckily it was a good year because so many imports were in the league because it was a lockout year for the NHL. So that pushed like every league like down. So like guys who maybe wouldn't have played in Italy were playing in Italy. NH some NHL players were playing in Italy, right? So, uh, no, it's but, like summer camp, right? Yeah, yeah. They were just stoked to be over there, just having fun, getting paid, <laughs> yeah. you know, just hanging out in Italy. Um, but like, I just looked at that level. Like, like a lot of guys would be like, "Oh, I'm in Italy," and in in my head, I think they were like, "I'll give an effort that I think like I can do well in this league." But like, I was like. I'm going to fucking own this league. I don't care who you are. I'm going to win at everything I do. And then that got me to a higher league. And then I got to that league and it was the same thing. Whereas a lot of guys would go over there and think like, Oh, I'll play over here a couple of years. This is the end of my career, you know, whatever. And I played overseas for six or seven years. And every single year I made more money than the last. And I went to better and better leagues. Japan isn't as good of a league, but they only take three imports. And a lot of the guys played in the NHL. So it's like really good money for, for what it is. And so like that, I was just trying to get, there but every year other than japan it was better league better league better league stepping up and like i take pride in that like Fuck yeah like like i fucking worked my ass off for that i don't you know obviously i wish i would have played in the nhl but i still had a great career and i got paid to play a game for 10 years yeah right <laughs> you, right you know, right, right. I played a game for 10 years that was my life i worked how two were, hours a day how were you able to like really transition into full gratitude for that instead of that little bitterness of a bite of not quite getting what you wanted. My concussion definitely helped because it happened at the beginning of my pro career. Now, obviously there was a lot of like, well, you dealt with the down early. I, I dealt with the down real early. And that also immediately changed the trajectory of my career. Like I, I used to be reckless on the ice, like offensively, like just <laughs> put my head down and like take the puck to the net. And like, if somebody, says the guy with a major brain injury. <laughs> yeah, no right, shit. <laughs> right. I was, I wasn't like tough in the sense that like I was a good fighter. Like I wasn't a great fighter. And I, I didn't even like there back when I played, there was like fighters, like guys whose only job was to goons. fight. Dude, like scariest men ever. Actually, Fucking goons, dude, man. hilarious story. The Bruins came, the Bruins assistant GM came to watch us play Western Michigan versus Miami of Ohio. And then the next weekend was playoffs and we knew we'd lose. We, we sucked pretty much. And so the weekend after most likely I would be, I would be signing. And they had a meeting with me and they're like, you know, we really like you think when your season's over, we're going to offer you whatever, but can you fight? And I was like, well, I could fight. And I like, but like, you know, I, 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 college, you can't fight. So I'm like, I, I can fight. It's been oh, three weird. years. Yeah, okay. no fight. You can fight before college. And then in college hockey, they don't let you fight. And then pro you can fight. And so I was like, yeah, I can fight. Like, you know, I'll fight anybody. I'm not saying I'll win, but like, I, I literally will fight anybody. And they're like, okay, you're going to need that with the way you play. Okay, so so listen to this fucking story. So I sign, uh, they fly me to Boston, I do my medical there, uh, drive to Providence, and then practice, my first pro practice is on a Wednesday in Providence. And uh, the, the Providence Bruins, their team was like the best the AHL's ever had. Like they were on like massive hot streak. They just had two days off, so the boys were partying. And Wednesday comes around, so I practice. I'm the fastest motherfucker out there because I'm just like, oh my yeah, god, right. I'm a fucking pro. Ah, right? Yeah, ah. yeah. And they're like, settle down, kid. We're on game 68. You know, because <laughs> college you only play like 35. This is old journeyman coming yeah, in with right, like lunch right. pail, like yeah, yeah. And I'm just like, ah, pro hockey, let's go. <laughs> and uh, uh, so the practice ends, and because they had two days off, we bag skated, meaning like cardio skate, mm -hmm. you know, not fun stuff, just like skate for 10 minutes, whatever. And the coach is like, all right, everybody on the line, uh, um, you know, Mac, go in the corner, work with, work with whoever. And the fuck, all right. So I'm skating, we're skating the lines, blue line to blue line. And I just hear like, pop, pop, pop. And I look in the corner and this guy, his name's Steve McIntyre. Look him up when we get off this fucking podcast. He's 6'6", 275, can barely skate. And there's another guy down there who came on the ice just for this, wearing a jersey, shin pads, and he's holding boxing, punching hand mitt things. And this 6'6", 275 monster is spinning around, holding this guy by the jersey, and just bop, bop. And we finish the skate, and the head coach comes up to me, Vex, go down in the corner, work with Dougie. And I'm like, the guy down there? <laughs> Fucking that gorilla down there? Doug the <laughs> So I go down there, that guy 
is the movie Goon is based Fuck on. Fuck yes. Swear, he is literally, that is, Doug, Doug is Doug, Doug Glatt. Doug the his Thug. Name, his real name isn't Glatt, but um, Dougie was our fighting coach. Yeah, Goon's a great movie. Yeah, and he is, they based the movie on him, right? Our so fighting coach. Yeah, and so I, yeah. I'm down there, and I'm standing there watching Matt go, and I, I don't know who he is. I'm It's my first day pro, and he's hitting these things, and all I'm thinking is back to my conversation with that assistant GM from Boston. Be like, yeah, I'll fight anybody, and I'm six six two two oh five looking at this six six two seventy five absolute meat house unit killer and i'm like holy fuck do i I have to fight guys like this here what the (laughs) fuck did i get myself into luckily i i learned like those guys only fight each other right and then there's another level of fighters that only fight each other some will go up when they're trying to like make a move make a move right every now and then down then there's like another level then there's like me (laughs) so i'm like i'm like i'm like four levels from this fucking guy uh but yeah that was my first pro practice i will never forget it so like with fighting and hockey now, because they don't have it in college and then it comes back in the pros, is it like a different strategy to the game if you know that you can use that type yeah. of tactic? Yes, 100%. How would that change it? Uh, it if so, like, we so that guy was actually the toughest guy in the league, like, okay. he fucked everybody yeah. So, you up. guys got this fucking killer on the like, ice, literally right? like, killer. And so, ga- like, somebody from their team hits one of our guys and it's a you know, a blindside hit or they hit like one of our best players, he's fucking over the bench yelling at them. Hey, you motherfuckers, anybody touches nine, I kill you. I'll rip your arms off and fucking kill you. And like, he would <laughs> he would never just fight like a random. Yeah. But like, just like the thought of him coming at you is literally, and then like their fighter doesn't want to have to fight him because he's literally the toughest guy in the league. He played in the NHL almost the rest of his career after that for a couple hundred games after that year with us because he was just knocking just a people goon. out. He was knocking people out left and right. Like, Fucking hand to doom. Yeah. So, so like, when your team has that guy, you can play a little rougher because, you know, you're like, yeah, talk to Mac. You know, like, yeah, okay, what are you going to fucking do? But, like, there were games where, you know, there was one game we played in Norfolk against, I think it was Tampa Bay's farm team, and they had a big motherfucker. His name's David Kochi. He played in the NHL. And if you look up David Kochi versus Dano Chara fight, you'll see somebody's nose literally explode oh, in front no. of your eyes. Yeah, Chara exploded this guy's fucking nose. Oh, fuck. But our fighter didn't put his tie down on in the locker room. And so you immediately get kicked out of the game because, like, if that comes off and your jersey's off, you have an advantage because the guy can't hold on to your jersey. Gotcha. So he gets kicked out of the game, but their fighter's still in the game. And I was just, this was probably like my fifth or 10th game pro. I don't know. And it was a completely different game having their guy be, have like all these, the toughness and we, nobody could touch. You could feel the full momentum. So you could, it was a momentum shift. Like, oh fuck, dude, we don't got Mac. So this guy's out there cross checking. Everybody doesn't fucking care. Doesn't give a fuck. You you know, like, what? fuck, this guy literally will kill me. Like I, I can't like, you know, yeah. Like it's like that big of a, because they were actual fighters. Like, they, yeah. weren't, they weren't really hockey players. No, Every, right, right. Everyone else on the ice is there to play hockey, and they are there for one reason yeah. alone. They're they're making 100 grand, 200 grand for one reason, <laughs> you know? And so, uh, it, yeah, so, it, yeah, it's interesting. Is that still pretty prevalent, like no, the whole goon culture? No, no, no. Uh, probably the last lockout, so the one where I went to Italy, like maybe, uh, maybe like 2017, 2018, 2019, somewhere around there, like now – the guys who are the toughest guys can actually play. They're nowhere near as tough as like that guy who like was literally playing two shifts a game. And one of them is a fight. Now, like the fourth line guys who will fight, they're still fucking tough, but they can also play the game and contribute in a ton of other ways, you know? So the game has shifted to a way more of a skill game, but we're kind of seeing now like the teams who play tougher, not necessarily have a fighter, but their fourth line can all fight and they can intimidate like because everybody kind of shifted to more skill base, like one team gets a little tougher and then starts bullying those. It's it's kind of a pendulum in hockey. Gotcha. Like whoever wins one year, everybody kind of shifts to whatever they did. <laughs> okay. And then somebody else wins and everybody's like, okay, well we got to do what they did. And more it just, aggressive. It, and- yeah. Yeah. And it's just kind of like skill, aggressive skill. And it kind of flows like that in hockey. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. whenever you, Where's your first place overseas you end up playing? Uh, Italy. So in Italy. Yeah. What was their big culture shock, man? Moving move to another country. Like, I'm curious about like what coaching culture is in those environments, because I know what it, 
you and I are about the same age, right? Like I'm 40 years old. Almost 30. 38. Okay. So I came up from coaches that motherfucker you. Yeah. Right. So like, that's one of those things I believe that why that inner voice of mine, that's like you fucking blah, 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 blah. Like I realized that's not really me talking anymore. It's right. some reflection of all of those or my right. dad or fucking whoever mm -hmm. else. Right. Mm -hmm. And also I got positive response from being talked to like that. Right. So I don't take offense to it anymore. Right. right. So what was the difference in culture going to European culture? You know, well, uh, well, Italy is fucking hilarious. They have a saying, <laughs> they have a saying there, Damani, and it means tomorrow because like it, you know, for better or worse, you know, the U S like you can get anything at any time. Mm -hmm. There's something while well, there's a Walmart open somewhere. There's a seven 11 yeah. open. Like you can get anything at any time. I lived in small town, Italy. Like our town had 770 people. <laughs> I also signed the contract without doing any research on the town. Oh, great stuff. So I learned in my first year going over to Europe, okay, do more fucking research. I could have very easily been on this timeline that yeah, you're on. Right. <laughs> yeah. So 770, we'd get like 3,500 people sell out like every game or whatever that rink was. And it was crazy, but the town had 770. So people are coming from different towns. Like I lived in a town, not a city. Sure. And so massive culture shock right there. And then Damani, Damani, like my gear didn't land with me when I came over. <laughs> and so like, I'm, I'm a pro athlete. They're paying me to be on the ice. And coach is like, well, where, where's your shit? I'm like, I'm, it hasn't come in yet. So every day I'm on the phone, I'm talking to the team manager, the GM, the owner, you know, I'm Damani, Damani, it'll be here tomorrow, it'll be here tomorrow. Well, stop fucking here. And it took like 10 days. Like, but that's just how they live. Damani. So that was... That was different, and and at first I hated it. Then I liked it. Then I went back to hating it. You know, I kind of <laughs> yeah. When know, it's really inconvenient, when it's really inconvenient. It fucking sucks, you know. But then you also like you know you see a lot of positives to different ways of life. So so Italy was the first stop, and um, you know everybody's like, oh, you must have loved living in Italy. And honestly, Italy was probably my least favorite country I lived in and played in. Did you fuck around um, anywhere outside? Did you? Uh, yeah, because like we played like all over the 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 country, like you know, but like. I went, uh, I got to see, like, I didn't go Are you to a Rome. single man during this time? No, I was married at oh, the time. Oh, good work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank yeah. God for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Could, could easily go off the rails if you're not, if you go over there single, for sure. A lot Jesus of guys do Christ, that. Jesus Christ, I fucking bet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A lot of guys go off the rails. That's probably also why they have shorter careers sometimes when they go over there, too. Um, but yeah, I got to see a bunch of, a bunch of Italy, you know. I didn't get to see, like, the sexy, warm parts, but, you know, so. Okay. I might, uh, but now I'm actually getting, uh, uh, I'm divorced from, from that uh, uh, woman. I'm, I'm getting married again this summer. Congrats. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Coming up in two months. Pretty excited. Yeah, right on, and we're thinking about going to the sexy parts of Italy with oh. the, the, whatever, the Amalfi Coast yeah. and stuff. So we might go there for a honeymoon. And I was like, yeah, I, I guess I'll give Italy another shot. But Why not, right? Yeah, I'll try. And so know. then you're in Japan. So that, well, I went from Italy and then I went to uh, Lillehammer, oh, Norway. Oh, so you're in Lillehammer. Okay. I went to Lillehammer, Norway. Uh, beautiful place. You know, got treated great. I, did my homework on the team more, you know, they pay on time, all this stuff. They pay on time. Did it, yeah. That, well, that's Fuck. the thing, man. In Europe, <laughs> the fact that you have to say yeah, that, like it's dude. so European. Well, like if, if you go to, and if you go to Russia, like, dude, you never know what you're getting in some of those countries. Uh, so, so, but like I, I had a really good offer from Russia one time and I, I, Literally, I Google the city and it come first fucking 10 hits. All they say is mass grave unearthed of a hundred prostitutes. And I was like, what the fuck? That's not I, ideal. I, and I was married at the time. I'm like, I'm going to show my, my wife this. Oh, this is where we're signing. Like, look at the money. But you, you know, you can't leave the apartment ever because you might die. Um, you know, it's just like whatever. So, but yeah, I go to Lillehammer, Norway, beautiful. I didn't realize how much more expensive Scandinavia is. Oh shit. So yeah. I'm, make, I'm making more money. But everything's seven times more expensive. Everything's fucking everything. I, I haven't been to Norway. I've spent a lot of time in Iceland over Iceland, the last okay. ten years. Yep. So relatively similar, right. In a lot of ways, right? Yeah, man. Like fruit, you know. I, I, I ate well. Dude, yeah, a banana. Like if a banana here is thirty cents, it's two te two dollars and ten cents there for one banana. Like it was crazy. So okay, I learned that experience. Went up in leagues to the Austrian league, which is a really good league over in Europe, and. uh my team was actually right outside of Budapest, Hungary, though. So, like, there was, like, eight teams in Austria, and then I think there was four teams. There was one in Italy, one in uh, Czech, one in Hungary. Where's the other one? I don't know. Somewhere, you know, around there, right? And just an awesome league. Had a great fucking time. And Budapest is, like, my favorite. Like, I love... Have you ever been to Budapest? No, I have not. Dude. It's on my, it's on it, my list. Okay, go. 
fucking okay. sick city and you're, you're ball in there because everything costs nothing. So we just got back from a trip to uh, South Africa. Oh, nasty. So same type of deal. Yeah, very Everything's cool. like 60% yeah, the cost wow. of being in America. Yeah, wow, yeah. Like, I'd look at moving to South Africa 100%. Wow, that's really cool. South Africa's neat. I've heard it's beautiful there. Yeah. On the, were you on the water too? Uh, yeah, so we went to Cape Town. Uh, you can take or leave cities for me at this point. Yeah, this is about cities. as much of a city as I'll live in the rest of my life. Yeah, I don't um, love cities. So getting outside of Cape Town is really fucking rad. Yeah. It was really, really cool. I dig the people. People are hearty and like yeah. not easily offended and outdoors type and don't seem to be as rush, rush, rush to get everything done. And I, I dig it. That's nice. That's especially as you get older. Yeah, man. There's the more you travel, right? Like there's parts of the American culture that I really look at that I, I think we feel like are rules of like how things have to operate uh -huh. and they don't. Yeah. Because, yeah. I mean, Scandinavia is a totally different thing, too, right? Because what I've liked about the Scandinavian friends I have is I, I find them – same way I would describe a lot of my Canadian friends. And one of the things I like about them is I find them all polite, but I don't find them pussies. Ah, well, until COVID. <laughs> well, and that's I a thought, government. I thought that, too, until COVID. Oh, I, was, is it? I, I love Canadians. I've never met a bad Canadian. And then I, I saw what happened to them at COVID and I was like, what the yeah, fuck? Yeah, but that becomes more of a government issue, yeah, not yeah, my I mean, personal but, take on Canadian right, friends. But, but I look at a lot of my friends who I were, I was like, oh, they're strong-willed motherfuckers. They're tough people, like, you know, whatever. And they just all just bent over and took it. And and obviously there's coercion and there's lying and there's all these things. But like, man, I, I, I was I was taken well, and, back. And perhaps we're used to being lied to by our government for longer. Probably, honestly. Right. Probably. I, I, I mean, probably that's part of the gig right now is yo, they fucking lie to us. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's probably that's a good point. Probably. And, and like as much as I could want to think that there's really nefarious reasons they lie to us. Yeah. I think the biggest one is because you know, we're fucking pain in the ass. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. And like, look what we've taught them how we operate. Right? right. Like, I mean, with toilet paper panic at the beginning of COVID, yeah. right. We fucked that up. Yeah. There's a reason they can't tell us the true information about a panic when it's coming. Right. Because we'll fucking freak out. Right. Yeah. It's a good point. And so, you know, there's some responsibility to be taken there too of like, we have to be treated like, like fucking idiots because well, look how we respond. I would also say, why are we idiots? And then I would look at like, hundred percent, you know, what all the shit that's on TV now. And like, man, they're like, so the youngest group I train in the gym is 18 to like 14 year olds. That's Whoa. my youngest group. I don't deal with anyone that age. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the only reason I have two 14 year olds there, it's mainly 18 to 16 is my youngest group. I have two friends, kids who are cool. in there. So I let them join. Um, but man, hearing some of the things like, you know, just in the gym and they're talking and me just like listening and like, dude, some of the shit these kids are into and going through now at these young ages is absolutely fucked. And well, like, you're living in Italy before, there's really good smartphones. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know what I yeah, mean? Like that's a way sure. different life experience and like learning how to manage boredom and do all this without the constant fucking. Yeah. Yeah. Input from that thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy, man. But yeah, it, you know, yeah, I, but I, I love Canadians. <laughs> right? Back to Canadians. Right, right. I do love Canadians, even though I do look at a lot of them as pussies now. What was like coaching, coaching culture from those two places? I'm curious to see now, like, because you're back here coaching kids. Yeah. Like what pieces did you pick up from each of those places that you're like, oh, this is rad? Yeah. Um, well, I had an American coach in Italy. I had an American coach in oh. in Norway. I had in Austria had an American coach. In Japan, I had one assistant coach who was Canadian. The other two guys were Japanese, and we had we had, we had three imports, and we had a uh, a translator that would go everywhere with the imports even on the ice, despite not being a hockey player. This guy's <laughs> job was a professional translator, so he can barely fucking skate. That's awesome. But, like, the team, you know, would meet at the board for, you know, talking about the next drill, and three imports are standing in the back with Kaname, our, our interpreter, and coach is talking, and then he's telling us, like, kind of, like, softly in our ears what's going on. And he's on the on the bench in games. So, like, if I was talking to one of the teammates and that was Japanese that didn't speak as good of English, or they're, like, in the heat of the moment and they can't think about the translation, like, we're talking through a translator to them what we're going to go do. It's on crazy how quick you can get used to it. Which is, which is, I think has, that has made me the best coach possible is playing in countries like Norway. 
Lillehammer, most almost everybody spoke English, like 99%, mm-hmm. 95, whatever. But like Hungary, almost nobody spoke English where I was. Budapest, everybody speaks English. Where I was 40 minutes down the highway, not everybody did. Japan, where I was, nobody fucking spoke English. Nobody. So like that was I got really good at reading people what they're trying to tell me with their body language Mm -hmm. like no words at all and like and I got good at miming like hey I want you to do this or this and like that's that's you know increased my ability to communicate to everyone even when they speak the same language as me because I've realized how like I can use no words and get somebody to understand what I want. Well, now if I can add words and I can do it in the shortest amount of time possible to get somebody to make a change in the gym, like right away they feel what I want them to feel or you, you know, like extend the hip when they're not getting through their hip because I can show it and I know, Mm -hmm. you know, so like I think playing in Japan was like one of the best things I ever did for now my coaching life. Yeah. For being able to improve your own ability to communicate. Right. 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 You know, it's, it's fucking fascinating dude because of, you know, as much as social media and as much as technology has continued to uh, take over. Yeah. Right. And it's going to continue because yeah. we're, we don't like inconvenience and yeah. that becomes, give it to me right now. now. I never have to wait <laughs> now. But one of the side effects I think that's been a really a big cause for a lot of the anxiety, a lot of the division driven in our country, a lot of all of those things is that we've gone away from interpersonal communication. Yeah. And you see it in kids, right? That like you'll text to, or like people that, you know, even for me, like the younger guys I deal with are all in their mid twenties. And so even texting and then talking to them in person is a whole different thing. It's fucked up. Where they just can't. It's fucked up. Yeah, they can't. Right. And so meanwhile, you're in another country and not able to speak the language recently, uh, Besides South Africa, we, uh, Brant and I were in Uganda for a bit on another trip with a friend doing some stuff. And so we stayed with this, uh, Batwa Pygmy tribe for about a week. Wow. We'll dive into it on your show. Wow. Uh, But like, they don't speak English. They speak Swahili and then speak like a dialect of Swahili that I sure as fuck don't know. (laughs) (laughs) But for the week that I'm there, it, it wasn't like I wasn't able to communicate. I was. And that's because 90% of our communication is done non-verbally. We yeah, learn all that. Right. But if you go to just this being the way that you communicate, it takes away all of those things, which are empathy tone, which are, I can read your intention instead yeah. of the words that you're saying. Yes. Massively important. Massively important. Man, these, these kids, like, especially new ones who haven't been in my gym yet, like, you know, every year I'll take on a couple new kids, but usually it's like the same kids and I'll train them until their career is over is usually how it goes. However far they go. Um, they're, you know, the new ones that come in eyes down, don't shake my hand, like don't say their name, you know? And I'm like, Hey, like, Take your fucking earbuds out. You don't wear those in here. Shake my hand. Look me in the eye. Like be right. a man, be a man. You know, and and you know, it takes a couple times. And then they stop coming in with their earbuds, and I'm like, what are you fucking doing? Like, talk to people. Talk. These are all your friends in here. Talk to them. They're in here right now. You're all here to push each other to get better. Like, be present. Be in here. You know, and so it's, it's man, it's bad. It's real bad. But is that, I mean, do you see that as a big shift, right? Like in the parenting, do you see it a big shift in the schools or, I mean, where do you think everything's fucking on computers and iPads and phones now? Like every kid goes to school and they get an iPad now. Why? Like, I understand that, okay, technology is going to be used in the future. And if they don't start now, like they'll be behind, but like behind of what do we need to keep moving more into living in a screen on a screen like no don't give fucking kids that well it's the fear that if we don't we'll get left behind yeah like no i mean i i I don't know i'm a huge andy frizella fan i'm a first form athlete i fucking love first form i've learned so much from them i was just at the thing this weekend where it was andy frizella ed Milet, and Mm -hmm. david goggins speaking and it was last weekend it was fucking awesome it was nasty and like one of the things they say is like Dude, in person, people are going to crave in person stuff and it's coming and it's like already started to come back, but like it's coming. It's you know, coming. We, we see it. Like yeah. that's the same thing with my mentorship group. Really? Coaching group. Oh yeah, dude. Being able to get people together and yeah. form a community of people that like you vibe with. Yeah. You know, people that have the same drive, people yeah. that you don't have to explain that, get it to. Yeah. Just, they want to be around. They want to be people. around other people getting shit done. Yeah. And that's like, it's coming back. So like. I look at that too. Like I said, I don't know if it was on air or 
off or like when I'm coaching my guys, like I also want to constantly be coaching them. Like this will be valuable in life too. Like this is a metaphor for whenever you're done with hockey, whether that's in a year, five years, 10 years, 20 years, like you, you do this now and you're able to do this right now. And it's hard later in life when your boss asks you to do it or you're the boss, it's gonna be fucking easy. So like, do it, you know, get uncomfortable and, and yeah, hey, just got to keep pushing these kids out of that, out of that, like living on a screen shit. And how, so you, you do social media. Yeah. I, f- I struggle with that. It's tough. I'm, I'm like, I'm keeping them on the screen longer by me putting out. Yeah. It's stuff. a really fucking weird thing. Right. That like, I believe I have a tough time with it. So I've had to kind of look at it like this, right? Like, I don't believe that there's any problem with social media or technology at a at its base, right? Mm-hmm. That like, it's not inherently bad or inherently good. Nothing really is. It's how, it's it. how we use a tool. Mm-hmm. And if we're a group of people who've decided what gets majority of our attention for some reason is shit we don't like, mm-hmm. that's a really weird choice. Bad choice. But that is what a lot of people choose. Yeah. And because of the way the algorithms are set, right? Because and let's say you and I are inventing an app and we're going to have a ton of information on it. And I was like, hey man, what if we just set it up so that like it knows how long you looked at a certain thing and like what you liked and what you commented on and like what slowed down your scroll. Yeah. And we gave you more of those things because that's what you're interested in. Right. No one would have ever been like, but what if they just look at shit they hate all the time? Aren't we just flooding them with stuff that they don't want to see? And and everyone in that room should go, why would people do that? <laughs> yeah. And we fucking do. Right. We can't help it. And I don't know if that's evolutionary wise because for so long, we had to look at the things that were going to kill us Mm -hmm. and put focus on it. Yeah. Yeah. And now we don't have any of those needs left anymore. Right. That like the physical thing, you know, is dwindling. Right. It's really getting weird that it's become a necessity, right. That like in the last two generations of people where people still had physical jobs and labor jobs and were in better shape and physical fitness was still taught in school and all of these things to now, it's it's really weird to explain that like, oh man, the idea of success and comfort from not having to physically work is a mistake. Yeah. You now, since you don't have to do that for your job, it's still really important that you go check that fucking box every day. Otherwise, as a species, we get really fucking weird. Right. Right. And dude, our bodies do nothing but adapt to the stimulus we give them. Right. Nonstop, yeah. right? They're yeah. like losing weight. Oh, this ain't fucking magic. It's a, it's a math equation. Yes. And you can pretend I'm doing it. And like, you're, you're not, it, you're not, you're lying. You're not, you're lying. You're either lying or you're ignorant to like the amount of calories you're spending and eating. I right. believe you may think you're right, but you're not, but the evidence is counter. Yes. <laughs> and, and the saying that like, well, my friend Jim does this, like it doesn't fucking matter. It's your metabolism. And Jim's lying to you. Right. Also, you've <laughs> got to figure out your fucking machine, right? Of like yeah. what, how, it, yeah. What, what is your machine? What does your machine to? work? Well, yeah. Yeah. You know, and perhaps that you've never even decided to say, well, fuck, how do I feel if I only eat this? Right. You know, right. run the experiment yourself instead of waiting for the information to tell you. Oh, weird. When I, when I exercise, I feel better. When I feel better, I perform better. Well, when except for the first better. time. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah, except yeah. for that overcoming that first time of the insecurity of, right. I don't know what I'm fucking doing when right. I go in here. No right. one ever taught me how to work out, which is now something... I feel like I should know by this age and I'm embarrassed. Which how fucked up is that? That that's not like we have one body. I say this all the time on my social media. We have one fucking body. Please take care of it. And if you don't, you're going to regret it one year, five years, 10 years, 20 years. You are going to regret it, whether it's through surgeries or it's through you fall and you don't have the ability to catch yourself like one way or another. And there's also things that you're never going to be able to avoid, but you can maybe be a little prepared. So they're not as bad if you mm. go through something like that. And I always think about that and, it's disgusting that physical fitness is not a major priority f- all the way. Like there should be a class in that from kindergarten through senior year of college. Like why are we putting out 22 year olds into the world or 18 year olds into the world? And they don't know how to like, look at, they don't know what macros are. They don't know which foods have proteins and car. Like how, well, but how? look at what the recommended food shit from yeah. our government is. So right? that like Cheerios were fucking listed higher on the, on the, recommended list than than red meat so you said i don't believe it's nefarious come on bro that's nefarious (laughs) that's nefarious right there that's on purpose that's misleading on purpose okay so here here becomes my question then 
is to really dive down to it. Is my government putting that out? Like, is there a bunch of group of people in a room that was like, this is going to keep them fat and stupid. Send it. Or we did a bunch of studies. Now the studies are shitty because we allow lobbyists and different people to pay for them. And that's how yeah, things get going. Right. And so the information gets put out unbiased due to this completely biased bullshit <laughs> yeah. that paid to get the study done. Yeah. And because, you know, we're a capitalist society, this is the God we've chose to pray to. Yeah. Is that of money and the, and not only just the God of money, but the God of it, it's, it's fucking Henry Ford. Right. Right. That like everything has to be made into an assembly line to maximize profit for not the highest quality output, but just serve the masses. Right. And so, so is our education system. Yeah. It doesn't treat outliers to any way very, very well. Yeah. And it wants you to sit down, shut the fuck up, listen to what you're told, obey authority. Yeah. And yeah. And join the fucking ranks oh. because we need you to join the ranks. You need to be a worker. We need workers. We need, we need workers. Yeah. We need workers and soldiers. Right. And like, like and, think about this. And I, I always ask people this and I've gotten good responses back that, that negate what I'm saying, but like, teaching kids that you can't go to the bathroom and you gotta go to the bathroom. You gotta ask and teachers can say no. Like how fucked up is it? You have to go to the bathroom. Whereas like before we created, you know, society, you had to go to the bathroom. You literally just start peeing right where you were, <laughs> you know, or maybe you walk five feet so you don't pee in your cave. And now like, can I go to the bathroom? No, you can't. Like what? Yeah, what the fuck do you know mean? I can't go to the bathroom. I'm not asking. Like I'm about to poop in my chair. Right? What yeah. do you mean? You want me to poop in the classroom? You know. Yeah, no, no, look, and I, and I can get it between the lines, right? Because I get how kids would abuse. That's and that's what and teachers come I back. I fucking at me with. get it. I, I get it because I would have. Right. Yeah. I would have. I would have <laughs> fucking kid that would have just never been in class. I was gone I for a half know an that. hour. Dude, I'm gone. Anytime I got out, I'm on the swing jailbreak, set. Jailbreak, motherfucker! I'm gone. <laughs> Yeah, no way. Like, I understand. Like, I don't know the don't right know answer, the answer right? I don't know what the answer is. Because, like... There's got to be a better one, though. I know that if I have parents that don't set expectations and love me with all full hippie heart and want me to express myself in all these ways, those people end up strange. Yep. Right? That yep. they don't end up able to handle um, hard times. They don't be able... You know, they can't do any of those things. Right. Um, they think especially everything when, should be fair. Yeah. That's not the right. real world. And I know that the opposite side of that doesn't do great either. Right. And so like, I don't know the proper combination of fucking hugs to beatings. Yeah. 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 That people are supposed to get in their life, right. but it seems to be a combination. Yeah. I would agree. I would that agree. like, you need to get your ass kicked sometimes to know where the line is and also understand that getting your ass kicked doesn't kill you. Right. Get back, get back up. Get, get back get up. Ba you're not dead. You got punched in the face one time. You're get back up. Right. Get back up. Yeah, I agree. I remember when like it was like kids started getting expelled from school for like one fight. And like 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 younger, not like seniors where you could really hurt each other, but like even then, I don't know. But I was like, man, like a fifth grade getting expelled for one fight? Like there was no weapons or anything like that. It was just they like, just had a had a fight and there was like a couple punches thrown. Now they're expelled. I've only That's seen that, do. that. How does that not only benefit bullies? Yeah. 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 Right. Because yeah. like, oh man, as a fucking terrible sound clip that could be cut from this, right? Like the idea of like removing guns from a society means only criminals have guns. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I pose and, this one. And this so is wouldn't that, isn't that the kind of way, like if I'm not allowed to stand up to a bully in the way that he stands up to me. What is there to stop that guy? He's already a dick. Yeah. He breaks the rules. Yeah. Yeah. And now you're going to take away my freedom to protect myself. <laughs> right. And he's going to keep it. Yo, his, since the, the beginning the of time, bullies don't pick on people that punch him in the face. Right. Even if you get your ass kicked by said bully. Right. Right. I mean, I think about that. Bullies pick on the weak. Yeah. I mean, they don't pick on the things that fight back. They're not ambitious. Right. I mean, well, so, you know, like. I don't even want to get into this topic, but I fucking like talking about everything. Cause I just like talking about things. So many people now just can't have a conversation about anything because they just go off the rails and then you mm -hmm. can't be friends. And you're like, dude, what? I'm just talking to you, man. Um, like the, the whole, like, Oh, should we put an armed guard at every school? And people are like, we shouldn't have to do that. Well, we shouldn't have to do a whole bunch of things, yeah. but we live in the time we live in. But then I read something online and it was like, you know, who protects the president? People with guns who protects banks people with a gun who protects you know some shopping centers malls people with guns and, who and, protects and, all these things so then like so so what i perceive that is if you break that down well the bank 
is worth more than the kids in the society because we'll put a guy with a gun there and be totally fine with that. We've proven that time and time again. Mall. So then, like, why can't we put, you know, the fucking the, the guard there with a gun? Because it's because it's a real bummer for Americans to have to swallow the truth that says our schools are fucking dangerous. Yeah, because yeah. that's that's the that's actual the problem. problem. Yeah, is that having guards at every school says that America's not fucking safe. Right. But, and but it, it doesn't everywhere else. Like, hello, like, you right? Know, like, no, no, no. What? That's but that's we're we're fucking lunatics yeah. in that way. Yeah. We're absolutely crazy that we ever, like. There's a big group that just wants it to be 1950 again. Yeah, and it it ain't fucking coming back. Right. right, right. Like we've we've made some weird choices and we've gone far enough down the gun rabbit hole. Yeah, and we're not going the other way. Yeah, yeah. And so there needs to be another solution. Is there a fucking problem between? I like the ability to go defend myself and protect my family and conceal carry and do all that and can follow the rules and learn how to shoot and manage and do all these type of things versus anyone should be able to get a gun as soon as they want. Like, fuck, there's got to be a line yeah, yeah, so somewhere. Tough. And I don't, I don't know how to draw it. I threw fucking rocks in a field. <laughs> I ain't fixing to solve this motherfucking problem. Right. Right. But right. I know shit's fucked. Right. Yeah. Same. And I Same. like seeing guys like Tim Kennedy start fucking schools that are, yeah. you know, pushing some different stuff, getting yeah. people physically educated, getting people smart, right. you know, doing things that are really fucking useful yeah. instead of the education culture that we've built, which is memorize shit to pass a test so that we can get funding to, to continue on. Right? right. Like that's our fucking whole system, which yeah. is not education based, right? not comprehension based, right. not it's not problem solving Com based. Yeah, yeah. Oh my God. I, Yo, it's regurgitate this and I don't need you to tell me why it's this way. Yeah. That, and that's something where you're saying, oh, you notice them with kids. Like I've noticed like the, the ability to problem solve like on their own in the moment, like, like a whole bunch of things. I, I had this guy fly me out to a, a hockey camp to run their off ice stuff in New York on Long Island three weeks ago. And, uh, so I was, there was like a hundred kids there from probably 18 to 10. And man, like, like there, it was wild. It was wild. Cause I don't work with kids like below 14, sure. and usually below 16, but like, oh man, it was, it was, I couldn't believe like, and I've worked with little kids like for a long time. So it's not like I just never work with kids and then I'm seeing kids and I'm like, oh my God, but I'm man, they like, they're, they're. Well, that's now a generation that would be raised by phones. people in their thirties. Yeah, yeah. 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 You know, right. so that's, it's a step. Right. You know, like, especially the transition from analog, which was most of our youth, to right. being a more digital. Right. Yeah, it's crazy. And look, the tech thing. Also, as a species, we're pretty good at thinking like 50 years is forever. Yeah. Like, that's basically as long as we can kind of wrap our head around things. It's right. like, we can't, I can't really get too comfortable with like whatever my great grandfather's life was. Right. It's just too far removed. Yeah. And that's just like yesterday, right? Like mm -hmm. in the grand scheme of things. Mm -hmm. And as technologies continue to come in, like we still don't have people that have had like full lives with tech. Right. And so we're in a big transition. That's interesting. And of course the pendulum has swung to this place of like, holy shit, it's, it became the wild west. Yeah. Right. That there weren't regulations or rules or any of that. And, there has to be figured out yeah. in the same way the wild west with tech with whatever we're seeing with ai yeah you know that fucking toothpaste ain't going back in Dude, the jar man scary. that's that's open fucking scary so it's either learn how to use the fucking tools and go forward cuz we, we can't turning a blind eye and be like turn that off yeah that's a mistake too right. we have to figure out how to use it right and so what i kind of fucking hope right like i think the ai thing is going to butt fuck a lot of like entrance exams and things like that uh -huh. to where like, if you have to write an essay. Yeah. Chat GPT. Yeah. Get all fucking, the kids talk about. Yeah. It. Of course. Yeah. Why wouldn't they be right? Yo, I did most of my papers in college out of Wikipedia, which yeah. isn't fucking allowed. That's not a real source, <laughs> but it was in college because teachers didn't know any fucking yeah. better. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, the, the chat GPT thing, like perhaps this switches to where now people have to do more verbal exams Yeah, because then you can't rip off this copyright thing, wow, right? Wow, that would go the other way hard. Kids would be rattled. 
Well, and then like you learn to communicate, yeah. you have to express an idea. Like our tests are now a comprehension based. Let's have a discussion about yeah. the material. Yeah. That's the, I think one of the, it's just really hard to scale real. Yeah. Extremely. And then who's, who does it produce better, smarter people? I think so. hundred percent more productive for sure. In society being yeah. able to are, talk to other people. Are we, go, we interested in that? We're not. No, not it's at not all. It's not the most profitable solution. But where does that end? Five years, 10 years down the line. But that's that's dummies. the route we've chased, right? Yeah. Like, and even I even got to thinking about it about like food choices in our country. Oh, yeah. And, and you've now lived lots of other places. Yeah. We eat oh, in an obscenely fucking disgusting way. Right. It's embarrassing. It's like, literally embarrassing. But also the food quality here is worse. Like people worse. always say, oh, we're the best country in the world. We're the best country in the world. On and, what and, metric? Uh, yeah, on what metric? I also, because of what I saw happen during COVID, then I was like, okay, yeah, we are. Because we were eight. People were able to be like, fuck that. Whereas in a lot of other places, they were not. No, were arrested. <laughs> Canada, you, you protest, we take your bank account. What? And we saw that here what? too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, make no mistake, you push back far enough here, you're getting fucked. Like, and that, the, that is terrifying. Like, what? What? That's really scary that that can be a thing now. I mean, that's, that's really fucked up. And where that goes on a long it's enough timeline, no, it's not great. It's definitely not great. I don't remember what I was going to say because now I'm just thinking about those truckers getting their bank accounts stolen for protesting. Fucking bank accounts. Stolen, like, dude. what? What? Like it's a bit of an overreach. That is pretty scary. Yeah. That's pretty scary. Yeah, we're in a very, very strange time in our country. Yeah. I don't have all the answers for it. I just... I wish you did. Yeah, you know, man, fucking... Le I think less division for one. I think oh. because we get so identity driven, right? That like even, you know, us as athletes, right? Yep. That there's this big chunk of our life that's so based on Matt Vincent athlete. Right. And then when that ends... Yeah, who the fuck am I? Yeah, that's something a lot Especially of, of like, athletes have. Not just athlete, like I'm not the Highland Games guy right. or professional hockey player right. or any of this. So like right. this kind of thing that I've used to introduce myself. And dude, I remember feeling like little stings of that. Like, um, you know, in high school I had a Jeep, right? And like, I felt that that was a big part of who I was. And like guy. when I fucking sold it. Yeah, man. I remember like, you know, I think I remember asking a girlfriend, like, are you still into me? Like, if I don't have this Jeep, <laughs> I'm fucking sure thing. I know, right? I fucking know it. Yeah. But yeah. like, oh, fucking fascinating. Yeah. That my, like, my I, I can recognize Jeep. it all the way back, right? That's, my girl had a Jeep. She sold it right after COVID and she was like torn. And I was like, and it was beat up. I'm like, this thing fucking sucks. What do you mean? She's getting this brand new, beautiful car she's worked so hard for. And she's like, ah, I'm not just not going to be, I think she might even said, I'm not going to be a Jeep person. Yeah. I was like, what the fuck? Get in the new car. That thing's beautiful. Yeah, Get rid of this. Weird identity, man. Yeah, weird but identity. That is, that is interesting. And that's something that, did you... Uh, did you was that really hard for you I, I would think maybe and correct me if i'm wrong because like we're all, all in our own silos so maybe it didn't but like since the highland games isn't the nfl sure like known by everyone everywhere you if you say i played in the highland games or i, I participated some people out there at a walmart target wherever they might not know what that is whereas the nfl i would think most people would so when when players at at those levels are not that anymore. You, I see a lot of identity. Yeah, of course. And, and searching, and a lot of guys drink too much. You well, know? especially if, say, the most money you'll ever make in your life and the greatest yeah. amount of praise you've ever gotten was when you were fucking 23. Right, For right, doing a thing. Right, right. I bet it's really fucking hard on the yeah. backside. Look, the Highland Games, like, there's no real money in it, right? Like, right. even at the best in the world, I probably made 25, 30 grand. Right. Competing a lot. Right. Uh, it was great fun. Yeah, Got to travel around the world and fuck off and you got paid in a whole bunch and, of yeah, other ways. Total great experience. Yeah. Um I like I never had any identity issue attached to the Highland Games thing. Like okay. I remember competing and being asked about stuff. And like one of the things I remember saying was like, Yeah, none of my PRs are gonna be on my tombstone. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? They're right. a thing I did, they're not who I am. Right. However, being an athlete, yeah, that part I didn't know how to deal with. What part what part? Um, Going from being second best in the world at my thing and being really physically strong and capable to now I travel with a cane and like I can't walk more than about 200 yards a day before like the chronic pain thing reaches a point where like I'm no longer cool to people I'm around. Right. Yeah. And having that piece of like, you know, having to say no to things yeah. of like, hey, we're going to we're going to go do food trucks, blah, 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 blah. And maybe like, well, it's walking. What does it look like? Like where how far are we parked away from? Wow. Yo, having to really Damn. be considered on that type of shit. And yeah. um that's a big change. 
that identity. That's a big change. Made a huge swap to me because I felt like I don't ever get to show anyone again. Yeah. Right. Like yeah. what I'm physically capable Dude. of because yeah. you know I spent so many years mastering throwing and then the Highland Games in particular. Right. I'm not going to find a second thing I'm best in the world at. Yeah. Probably not wow. fucking happening. Wow. And it's yeah. it's gone and not just gone. It's not like I mastered guitar and I can still fuck around. Right. Like you can still go skate. Right. And yeah. I'm sure. Ish. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. But like yeah. you still get on the ice yeah, and fuck off with kids. And yeah. I can't do my sport. Yeah. You're not all. going fucking. Right. No, it's just fucking <laughs> done. Wow. Right. And so like yeah. this. This knows how to fucking do all of it. Right, right. I just can't make can't this thing make work. That, so there's a disconnect. Yeah, and it's always done it. Yeah. You know, without having to think. Right. And so, like, having that taken away was a really big thing of just lack of confidence that I didn't trust my machine to work anymore. Wow. Yeah, it was it, it different for me, but same, same, but different. Like, yeah, I'm sure with the brain. Like, like, but But for me, too, just, like, when I'm in front of kids and, you know, like, the oldest guys I train, like, the pros who are older – you know, they, they all, I played with them. Like they all, I was only a couple years older than them. They know what I look like on the ice. They know, like when I say things, like I mean, 100%, mm -hmm. like when I'm saying I did this, like I fucking did this. And those, when I was playing and we'd go to the bar on Friday and Saturday night, I had deli meat in my pockets because I was like, I can't go catabolic. I got to fucking kit the, pr and this is like, a, all the boys chirp me, but like that, that's how dialed I had to be. Bro. Yeah. Like when I say it wasn't good, like I had to, every single time, just got turkey. Now, in now how much do you believe you had to be that dialed? Like really that it mattered, say for the physical, like, makeup of it or mentally for you that like yeah, i can't both. leave chips on the table uh both both for both both i had to absolutely maximize every single output i could possibly to be at those levels or else i wouldn't have been there but then also i learned that that gave me the confidence to be on the ice with those guys who are way better than me you know like that like, you didn't have fucking turkey in your pocket on saturday night <laughs> you I, you missed three meals I fucking didn't miss a meal. You know, like I'm, I'm ready for this practice. Yeah, it's an edge, not. right? When I go into the corner with you, like I'm fueled. You're not, you know, like in my head, that's in the back of my Dude, fucking Dude, those head. little moments that give you that edge, right? Like even what you were saying about getting up in the middle of the night to go back and work out like, yeah. and it's haunting you. Like, yeah. fuck you, I take action. Right, right. And so like the hard part now with everybody who's like, probably like my guys in the NHL, they're like 23. They've all skated with me. Like when I, they were like 15, 16. So they were getting good. So they saw me on the ice a couple of times and know like, like I mean what I say and I did how I played, how I say I played yeah. and all this stuff. But the young guys, they don't know. And so like, like, for me to be like, you know, I'd be like, I fucking, I would have ran you through the wall right there. Like do it the fucking right way, you know? And like, they they believe it, but yeah, they, but don't, they don't. But it's not at a hundred where no, it's no, like no, it's not where it's same. like like I'm telling you, if you do it this way, and you're as skilled as you are, which is way more than me, you're gonna be way fucking better. So like, do it at this intensity level, or do it this way because it will get the best result. I know what I'm fucking talking about because I had to find what the best result was, or else it wouldn't have been in those conversations. So like, do it that way, and I can't just like they don't know, they don't know because they haven't seen me, and no, I can't I can't show them. And I can't play the way I used to play because I barely play it anymore. I only play in charity games because mm -hmm. I've had 14 concussions. If, <laughs> yeah, I miss, yeah. if I miss a week in the gym, you know, in the summer, I'm losing a lot of fucking money. Yo, so the risk ain't so worth the it's reward not anymore. worth the reward. And that hurts me too. Like, yeah. God damn, I can't even go out there and play with the boys and have fun with my friends. And But it is what it is. You know? So where do you, do you have any other outlets outside of work? The gym. Just your like, own training. Yeah, like I just love fucking working out. And now you love it for the sake of working out. Yeah. Because like, man, I, I need I a thing. I do. I fucking love working out. Like I just love going it. in to train is just I love it. I love going in fucking around and trying new things and trying to just like move in different ways yeah. and breathe in different different parts of exercises and feel if I can make something a little better or tweak it to be a little bit more specific to what certain guy needs to work on. Like I like doing that. I like finding new challenges in the gym, finding like my big thing is when I was coming up and for you is the same for, for football. Um, maybe, maybe even, even track like the workouts were like, were, were, were like in between powerlifting and body yeah. bodybuilding. Yeah, there, yeah, yeah. There wasn't a lot of like athletic development and yes, Anybody listening, don't come for me. Yes, strength will equal more power output and speed and all that stuff. 
but at the highest levels at a certain point, everyone's there because their, their athleticism, their, their ability to like know where the play is going before it goes there, their vision, their body control, their ability, manipulate space and time in any sport that requires physicality. Like those are all really big deals. And if I can increase that, and, and only increase your squat a little bit, you're going to be a better hockey player. Oh, right. Right. Like, there's a certain point where I'm like, you're strong enough. I want to get you to that point and we're going to keep working on that. But we're also going to throw in all these things in the gym that will make you a better athlete and a, specifically a hockey player, the NFL guys train something like for them. And, and there wasn't any of that. So like I started doing that and my career fucking took off for me and the player I was. And so like for, for, you know, 20 years now, I've been just screaming that to everybody. Hey, there's more to training for sports than back squats and bench right. press. Right. Those really, for most people, they really don't matter that well, much. Well, I mean, the second you came in here and saw the jammer arms. Yeah. yeah I'm like, fuck, you got all, you got a million bars. You got all this. And I'm like, jammer arms sick. Yeah. <laughs> you right. Know? You know, as an athlete too, like I, you know, my strength training came through this powerlifting thing and then strongman, right? Which is basically max strength. Yeah. And so what I'd learned a ton of is I can get stronger. Right. I understand what that requires. I understand the periodization and how to build programming yep. around it. Um, and then when I switched from strongman and powerlifting, which are so max effort focused mm-hmm. to Highland Games, well, the weights in Highland Games don't ever go up. Right. It's the same implements, kind of like track and field. Yeah. So it's mostly throwing, right? And so the idea is you got to throw it further. Yeah. So I need to get faster and improve technique and while being max strength. Right. So it's a lot more mentality of like being a good Olympic lifter. Yeah. Where I need to be max strong, right. but if I can't transfer it, it doesn't fucking matter. Right. And that's that whole piece is that transfer to whatever your tra- like sport, if we're talking about sports, is that transfer to sport. And it's like, man, there's so many things you can do to transfer through sport. Like just for example, like speed. Okay. Yeah. You get more powerful. You're, you're going to be able to d- put more power into the ground. Right? Yeah. But and, if you're maxing out a squat that takes six seconds to complete, that ain't going right? to do it. Or your movement is inefficient. And that's like the big one is that I focus on is like movement efficiency. And like I break down, you know, different body parts, build them up through different ways, then build that back into a certain movement. And like, let's get your movement as, as fit, as efficient as you can. And, and because that's a low hanging fruit, you, it's not, you don't have to put, it's, to put 20 pounds on your squat at a, at a high level, that might take you months, you know, but like to help you learn how to be a more efficient mover by, by listening to your body, feeling different things, you know, changing positions of your joint angles or something, you immediately get faster if you understand that versus three months to add 20 pounds to your squat. Right. So like, that's like a big thing for me and find, I love like playing with the variables of you know, getting stronger, power, speed, you know, transferring it to athleticism, movement, efficiency, mobility. How do these all come together to make the best athlete yeah. possible? And I just love like always trying to tinker and toy and find a way to get it's a like little infinite bit infinite puzzle. And yeah. then as soon as you mix that infinite puzzle with an individual. Yeah. Because then there, cause they, this guy has this and this that are bad, but this guy's got totally different things that he could work on. And yeah, yeah the 20,000 so foot view is very similar, right? Yeah. Like they need to train every day at about an eight out of 10 fucking level of intensity right and not get hurt yep and we'll make progress right but right. like dialing in for you know individual then by the sport and then by the position and then yeah. by the athlete like that's yeah. where it starts getting really cool yeah i love that shit it's yeah. so fun for me so man like pretty obvious right that like you have an intensity yeah about you like why do you think so many people don't have that about their lives maybe lack of reflection honestly uh i just reflected in seventh grade, when I told you, when I put that first summer of work in and I immediately went from like the worst 12th player to like the sixth, I was like, fuck. Like, and the reason I reflected is because I was a pussy. (laughs) I was a huge pussy. I'm naturally extremely skinny. Like if you look at my wrists compared to like the size of, of my muscles, like I am, you know, my, like I'm naturally a skinny little bitch. And, and, you know, I realized, Okay, well, what what can I do here to change that? Okay, sure. this is I'm I'm skilled, you know, enough at that time, but like this thing I'm afraid to get hit. This is holding me back. Okay, well like I learned that when I started, you know, working out, lifting weights, whatever, that immediately built confidence. When I had confidence, I wasn't scared to get hit. I was, you know, able to get to the puck first and not scared of what was going to happen so I could then make a play and that made me better. That all came by being by being able to reflect and look at myself in the mirror and be like, "Where are your holes?" Where are the holes in my game? I think a lot of people don't reflect. And I try to literally like reflect 
like at every session guys leave and I'm like, what could I have done fucking better? Did I really get, did Mike listen to that? Ah, I could have said something different that maybe would have had a better outcome. Okay. So like next time I talk to Mike, I'll, I'll try coming from this angle because he didn't respond the way I wanted him to him here. Right. Like, Oh, was my timing off on that joke I made where I wanted to break the ice when guys are tired, you know? Cause like, I, I, I like to have fun, you know, so I say <laughs> yeah, stupid yeah. shit. Literally when guys are about to die and puke and die and kill themselves because they want to, like I make a joke at a certain time and I'll make that joke every fucking session throughout the day. So like my social media guy, if he's at a couple of sessions, he knows it's coming, you know, but like, cause I know and I study and I reflect, I need to be better right here. Cause they needed me in this, in this scenario right here. They needed me to lift them up. Right. That breaks the ice. Okay. Back to it, boys. Let's go. You know? And so I constantly am reflecting. So I think to answer your question long windedly, uh, the, a, a lack of reflection is, is a big problem with most people. They yeah. Don't, awareness. They don't right? want to be honest with themselves. Being able to say, Hey, I did that thing. It didn't work out the way I want to. Maybe I should try something. So why else. don't I change it? Why don't I try and do better? Why don't I learn about it? Oh, no, 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 no. I'll just blame everybody else. Boy, everybody. They didn't get it. Fucking blame. Everybody. Yeah, yeah. They're not else. funny. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They didn't get no, you're a dick. <laughs> yeah, you fucking losers. Um, I, I say it in the gym all the time. If I'm in the middle of coaching something and I got 20 guys in there and 18 of them do it a different way than I wanted, I immediately stop and I say, guys, I fucked up. It's on me. It's always me. It's never you. Like if you do something not the way I want it, it's because you heard it in a way where it didn't resonate with you, which is a me problem. That's not a you problem. That's a me problem. I need to figure out a better way. And I learned all that from like Japan and yeah. miming and like, oh, you don't understand what I'm trying to say. So I got to say it in a different way quickly without words. So for you to understand what I want you to do right now, you know, and so I, it all comes down to reflection, I think. No, I I love that, right? Like the big stuff that I work with, you know, my mentorship group and coaching on is, is self-awareness. Mm -hmm. Like I think without that, it's, we're kind of fucking at a mute point because right. if I can't get you to be aware of what habits you've had that aren't helping you, we can't change it. Right. If right. we can't look at holes, you know, that need to be changed in our lives, whether that's how I communicate with my spouse, my partner, myself. Mm-hmm. I can't change it unless we identify it. Yeah. 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 And instead of like, well, we're not going to look at that. Right. You know, like, we have to. Like example of that. Cause I like, I like, like I said, like illustrations really help my brain. Like I couldn't figure out my online training. I started during COVID because of COVID. Right. Luckily I'd prepared like for a week before that. Didn't know it was coming. i just, I just filmed 50 videos with yes. this guy. And so I was ready. So I made 10 grand the first month of COVID being computer inept, embarrassing oh, no. online, literally embarrassing. I, I don't even know how to use Microsoft Excel. No idea. And, and, and I made $10,000 with only a $25 program, um, and, and, and gave away thousands for free too, because mm -hmm. people weren't working, whatever. Um, but, but I couldn't figure out, you know, going into last summer, I was like, I'm a, pr I'm a pretty good coach. Like I work with a lot of pros, Olympians, like a lot of good people. And they keep coming back. Like my client retention rates, very high, whatever I do all these things. And I'm like, w why are there people that are online that have no idea what the fuck they're doing in the gym and they're millionaires from their online training. And I'm stuck at, you know, this number that I'm making right now. Like what's, what's, what's going on here. And because I was able to reflect, I was like, well, what I'm doing right now to showcase that and my marketing is I look at as my social media, mm -hmm. I'm not showing them like that. I'm a good coach and they're, so they're not trusting me. I'm holding the video showing what the guys are in front of me, but that's not, they're not being coached. It's just me showing what they're doing. And I'm like, yeah, that's what everybody's doing. And maybe I didn't have enough money at the time. It was, it, or I, it was like a tough decision to hire somebody to come in and mic me up and film me yeah. and show how I'm coaching so that, you know, a, cause I just love helping people train. Like that's, I look at a social media. I want to give away my knowledge for free. I, I wish <laughs> right. if I, could have followed me when I was a kid, I would have been a way better hockey player. And I'm like, that's fucking cool. I could help somebody for free every day. So I try to do that first and foremost, but then I learned like, okay, to, to grow to where I want to be, I'm obviously not doing something right to market it. So then I'm like, okay, I will extend myself maybe a little bit and I'll pay somebody to come in, film me, edit it, whatever, just me being me. And now I don't have to hold the phone or whatever. And you know, the last, the last you know, year, my online sales have, have my doubled bang, bang, right. bang, bang, double, 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 double. And so I'm, so I, because I was able to be honest with myself and not be like, why the fuck is everybody, why are all these dummies who are just jacked and juiced up, you know, selling a million dollars a year online and, and I'm stuck at, you know, this number, like why like, poor me? Mm. No, I was like, fuck it. I got to reevaluate. I need to do better. I need to find a way. 
I, maybe I can't afford this wholly right now, but I'm just going to try it and see what happens. Right. And it's paid off. So like, that's, that's just like how, how, reflections, everything. It's fucking everything. When do you think you made the big shift from, you know, your purpose being relatively self-serving of mm -hmm. becoming the best professional athlete you can to now you're focused on helping other people become the yeah. best athlete they can. Uh, when I, so there was a guy when I was, uh, in, in seventh and eighth grade who barely anybody was like making it out of St. Louis for hockey when I was a kid. Like I didn't really know anybody. Um, there's a guy above one year above me, Cam Jansen made it to the NHL. He's my good buddy. Um, one guy before that, but he took like a long time to make it to the NHL. So I was already probably a pro or in college when he made it to the NHL. So I didn't know a lot of guys. And this guy came back from college hockey and practiced with us a couple times. His name's Jay Verde. And I thought he was the coolest motherfucker ever. I didn't know what college hockey was, which is hilarious. Now every kid sure. knows it because of the internet. We didn't have the internet that, back then. And I was like, this guy plays college hockey and he's coming back skating with us and teaching us what they do in college. Like this guy's so cool. So I left home at 15 and a half for my hockey career and then junior hockey which is like the next level above like kid hockey I was playing in Omaha and I came home and I would just run practices for the team that I grew up playing for and I would stop kids and pull them aside and be like hey try this this is what I learned this year and then I'd see him do it and I was like guys help that kid get better that's like Jay to me and I was like oh I fucking love that like that's really cool so from 17 until I retired at 32 I would just come home and and always help the kids coming up also because I had a chip on my shoulder that nobody would ever come to St. Louis. When I was a kid, we had to, they, they literally were in this league called the MNHL, Michigan National Hockey League. They said, St. Louis Blue, AAA Blues, you can be in the league, but you've got to fly to everywhere or drive. Nobody, you're not good enough, basically, for us to come to you. Oh, shit. Literally, like for real. So I was out of town every weekend, almost every year, from 7th, 8th, and ninth grade. So I was like, fuck that. I'm going to help these kids so that they can like go to their prom because I, you know, I didn't get to go to homecoming or prom. I need to go to any of those dances, anything, because we had to go out of town. To be on the road, yeah. Right? And I don't look at it as a sacrifice. Sure. Like it was an investment in myself. Played fucking ten years pro. What's up? Um. So cool. But like, I I just like loved that feeling. And then you know, because the only reason I kept going was because of the gym. I went to school for exercise science. And then I was like, okay, the gym is where I'm excelling, and that's why my hockey career is where it's at. I I like leading people in there. I like pushing people. I like teaching people. So that was just like. Well, I, I, I love hockey. I love the gym. I don't love anything else. So yeah. I'm going to do the gym after hockey, you know, like Fucking that's, right on, that's man. where it was. And, and now that's just like what I love doing. And then the other part of that too, is I found that the gym is a metaphor for life. Like, like if you invest, time man, I wish there, that, it, that treasy line wouldn't continue to play itself true, but you know, it's such a great thing that you can do nothing but progress on in so many different directions, but it all takes effort and consistency. That's the only formula that has to be repeated no right. matter what direction you want to go. Simple, but not easy. And, right. and I like speaking now I've gotten into professional speaking because of the podcast mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And, 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 you know, I just like doing it, it, it motivating people like to fucking be more. Yeah, same. I was a skinny little pussy. I was a bitch. I was embarrassing. Nobody would have ever thought I would have went to juniors. Nobody would have ever thought I'd be the captain as a sophomore of a division one school. Nobody ever thought I'd sign in the NHL or play 10 years pro after my concussion. Like you can fucking do anything. You can do anything. And you're not fucking dead yet. When that concussion happened to me, I was like, dude, I'm basically, I feel like I'm dead. I feel like I'm dead. So like every day that I get after that shit, like that's a gift to me. And I want to help people realize like, like live fucking today. So I don't know. There's a lot of points in my life where I was just like, I love helping people be better. And then the last part, I guess, of that is because, so I got to play after my concussion, I got to play seven games in the NHL preseason. I had two goals, assist, a fight, a I was plus one and I hit a guy through the glass. So like for, yeah. for, for like, you know, a guy who's like basically <clears throat> camp is like tryouts for guys that aren't on the team. Like that's in seven games. I had three points. It's pretty fucking good. Right. And I wasn't a goal scorer at that level. So like that pretty good. I could play at that level, but because of the concussions and I had to change how I played and I kept getting knocked out. Like I didn't get to achieve my ultimate goal. You know, I didn't, you know, I was very, very fuck. I was, this far away, but I didn't get to achieve it. You know, I didn't get to play in the NHL. I didn't get to play for a season. I didn't get to become a millionaire from hockey. Right. So like I, I, every time I can help somebody achieve any goal, it like fills up this hole that I'll always have that I, I didn't get to achieve the goal. I worked for my whole life. 
Like I, I had to grind to get there, you know, and I'll never be able to go back. I'll never be able to fucking wear that jersey in a real regular season game. I got preseason. That's amazing. That's more than 99.999% of people. And I'm very grateful and thankful for it. But I'll never get to say I played in the NHL in a regular right. season game. So if I help somebody fucking lose five pounds, or if I help a kid make the team he didn't think he was going to, or have a better season, or get a scholarship, or one of my NHL guys add a zero to his paycheck the next year, I take so much fucking pride in that. Even if I helped 1%, I'm like, fuck yeah, I helped somebody else achieve something that they wanted to do. And for me, that's that's like why I live every day. <laughs> fucking hey, dude. I yeah. love it, man. Yeah. Um, I'm pretty sure you and I could continue on. Yeah, forever. <laughs> for just about ever. Um. Yo, let's do this again. Hell yeah. Uh, love where, it. where can people find you, man? Uh, I just sent everybody to my Instagram at Jeff Lavecchio, the word love, and then C C H I O. That's my Instagram. If anybody has any questions on anything, DM me. I, I try to answer them all. I get a lot because of the podcast and yep. my, my online training's big now. So, but like I try to answer every DM. Try, dude, try to. Dude, you're the man. I appreciate you coming in and sharing oh, yeah, it, dude. That, that was awesome. We well, got to meet new we people. Lift, yeah, man. We'll definitely do that. And I got to introduce you to my boy, Dr. Tony, since your body's beat up. Yeah. I played all over the world, you know, was in the NHL for camps and had the best doctors, the best chiros, the best functional sports med. He's better than every one of them I've ever seen. Okay. Ever. So like I mean, just he's here or is he he's uh, in Chesterfield right, right by on. my gym. So like as far as keeping your body healthy and getting your hip good, like, dude, you got to see this guy. Right on. Yeah. yeah. The last round of images I've had on my hip, let me know of how it are looks. They're not good. No, they're not great. Oh. There's some mechanical issues. It's not soft tissue damage hey, at this point. You're not dead yet, bro. <laughs> no, fuck no. I'll look, I'll replace the hip and I'll be fine. There you, you know, go, baby. People do it all the time. You'll find a way. Continue being a cyborg. <laughs> so thank you guys for listening. We'll talk to you next week.